Okay, this is session two of Dungeon World Leisure Domain. Uh, we are not having Maria because Maria had a family emergency, so um, but that's okay because we're kind of like kicking off sort of like the the new part of the of the series. So it's not the end of the world. We're not in the middle of anything. I want to begin by doing a quick recap of what happened last time, and then after that recap, I am going to um, ask you guys about your anchor fires. I don't know if you guys remember that from last time, but we're gonna. Or actually, we're going to do the recap, then I'm going to talk a little bit about the actual uh, kind of state of things in the mission, and then we'll do the anchor fires. So with that in mind, let's recap session one. So the party infiltrated the masquerade ball of a Lord Caspian Gaul in order to stop a Phantom Court assassination, or to more accurately, to interfere with Phantom Court activity. I don't think your handlers actually knew what was going to happen necessarily. They assumed it was an assassination. Uh, the Phantom Court assassin was there uh, not to kill a noble, but actually a young cook named Stenton. Uh, Stenton, after the fact, um, claimed he was likely being targeted by a merchant lord named Thessator Rigal because he was secretly courting his daughter, Thessalina Rigal. And, but here's some things. There are some aspects of this assassination plot that don't make any goddamn sense. And these need to be pinging you guys, all right? Because there's a lot of things about this that are so fishy. First of all, employing the Phantom Court to kill someone is a really big deal. A simple cat's paw could have taken out, uh, right? Like, so to get the Phantom Court involved to kill this cook is absurd. Um, and indeed, this Phantom Courtier was using some really big magic to take Stenton out. Um, it seemed like she didn't want to just kill him. She wanted to disappear him. That's a really important element here. She could have done a hundred different things to kill him, right? But instead she chose to open up a gate to, to an ocean dimension and try to pull him into it and then presumably close the gate up, right? So that's an interesting detail. Third thing, uh, one of the characters, I think it was Gunter last time, but it, it don't, it's not really important, but one of the characters was um, helping Stenton out at the end, kind of tending Stenton's wounds. It might have been you, Opry, I can't remember. But in any case, they glance down at his, they kind of glance down his shirt and notice that he has a bunch of strange tattoos on his chest. That's not no coincidence, okay? Um, out of character, we know that is very important. Uh, in character, you know it's very important too, I'm sure. In any case, he had a bunch of weird tattoos on his chest and um, you guys have that information. You don't know what it's about yet, but you have that information. It is entirely unclear what the Shadow Court's interest is here. Uh, the ostensible story is that they simply wanted to disrupt whatever the Phantom Court was up to, that the mere knowledge of a Phantom Court here operating in Eagle's Reach was enough to kind of get their attention. But a very bold, unprovoked move against the Phantom Court doesn't make a lot of sense because you have to, it begs the question like, why would you risk starting an outright war in Eagle's Reach with the Phantom Court for reasons that are like, kind of unclear, right? So, um, but you guys are just instruments and peons, so it's not your place to ask questions at the end of the day. So that was kind of what was going on with that whole situation. In another part of the Masquerade Ball, Lord Gall was employing members of the party to help him woo a young nobleman, Lord Ashton. Uh, indeed though, and in fact, Corwin got very close to Lord Ashton and Lord Ashton shared some very interesting rumors with him about the Opera House Leisure Domain. And it's called Leisure Domain, not the Leisure Domain. That's, that's not important, but it's just a detail. Uh, we're gonna talk about that in a minute. Uh, Corwin ended this brief affair by knocking Lord Ashton out and leaving him in a salon. So um, those are the big ticket items that I recall from, from the first session one. Is there anything else that anybody wants to bring to anything, anything else you guys want to bring to my attention that I may have passed over that would seem important? Okay, doke. With that in mind, let's talk about I'm gonna give you just kind of the backstory of the mission here, kind of what you guys are gonna be up to. So Lord Ashton Corwin, he told you about a rumor that a long dead wizard named Skilter Rune, I'm gonna type that in here. Long dead wizard Skilter Rune had hidden had hid a really powerful magical artifact somewhere in Leisure Domain. It might be 
you know, it might be somewhere in the, you know, it might be a prop buried somewhere in a, a prop storage room somewhere in the opera house. Uh, it could be, could be anywhere really. It's a, it's a big structure. In any case, this rumors start to go around uh, like rumors do sometimes. And in fact, I think probably what he was doing was probably like suggesting and hinting to you, Corwin, that, hey, maybe we could work on this together. Let's go get the magical item ourselves, right? Because you had displayed yourself to be a sort of like, dexterous, you know, kind of fellow, right? And so he probably was looking at an opportunity in addition to the love interest nickel, right? But in any case, uh, that might be off since you knocked him out. <laughs> uh, but you have this rumor. Now, because you are just a, uh, because you are a, a uh, because you are a, a, a shadow court bot of everybody here, you are the most like um, Manchurian shadow court, no agency bot. Uh, you shared this with your handlers, we're going to say. And this rumor about magical artifacts being hidden by long dead wizards actually dovetails really nicely with something that the Shadow Court has had its eye on, which is this. The, the Shadow Court is aware of a woman named Prim Glamour. I'm going to type that in the chat. Prim Glamour... Um, so it's off season at Leisure Domain, and during off season, the the actors and the other like people who are involved in the opera house, they and the singer, you know, the singers, the actors, whatnot, they sort of like they sort of like go on retreats, right? They kind of like just they kind of spend their money that they've earned over the season, you know, from the previous season, and they they drink and they hang out, and they they go out into nature, and they you know they just sort of like get ready, they get inspired for the next for the coming season, right? Well, during this like off time this woman prim glamour has sort of inserted herself and made herself a very important part of the company uh she is the reason why the shadow court noticed this is because she is the priestess of a cult dedicated to uh old king faunus i'm gonna type that in here now there are innumerable cults dedicated to the queens and kings of old um, Faunus is just one of dozens and dozens of these 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 mythical sort of semi mythical people who who ruled the world in the days of old, like in ancient times, right? And there's all sorts of like stories and rumors and myth that kind of rises up around them, right? Um, most people who venerate or who at least follow philosophies dedicated to these old kings and queens are trying to bring back a sort of like old way of doing things, right? They have this sort of like halcyonic, you know, revanchist view of like the of the world, right? That they want to reclaim something. And so that is kind of the deal there. The Shadow Court would not give a shit about this. They would have noticed it, put a pin in it, and then not cared. If not, but if not for the fact that you brought this rumor about hidden magical artifacts in Leisure Domain, those two things sync up for the Shadow Court. And they're thinking there might be something here where there's smoke, there's fire, right? And so you are all tasked with um, either getting your hands on this magical artifact, figuring out what it is and getting it, figuring out what Prim Glamour is, confirming what Prim Glamour is actually up to, um, you know, just learning more about the situation, basically. That's what you're tasked with doing. Uh, if you can get your hands on this alleged artifact, um, but that's, that's kind of the basics of what is our situation is. Uh, do you guys have any questions about any of that? Okie doke. Well, in that case, I think I want to go ahead and just, you know, assuming you have this information, um, your handler is, um, let me, let me look at something real quick. Your handler is a shadow court um, nun, I guess. They, 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 they have a sort of like a religious veneer, right? Even though they're not particularly religious, but they, they, they have temples and they kind of like have a, a religious kind of, you know, notion going on. They're technically part of the church. Uh, is a nun named Alacrity. Um, this follows a very common naming scheme in the Shadow Court, uh, where people are given uh, adjectives as names, right? Um, and it's an ongoing thing that, like, if you ask her why she's called Alacrity, she'll give you one of a hundred different stories, right? So, 
Um, in any case, your handler, Alacrity, uh, she's, you know, she's kind of giving you all this information. She's conferred with you, Corwin, about what you learned from Lord Ashton um, and all that stuff and, and have, has basically set you guys to figure out what's going on. I think at the moment that the action starts, it's going to be basically the day before the opening night performance. So there's going to be the day and then the night and then the following night is opening night, okay? So that's our time frame that we're working in. But before we begin all of that, you are encouraged by alacrity to go to your anchor fire and um, meditate and confer with the shadows. And so now I want to know where your anchor fire is in Eagle's Reach, what it is, why it's important to you, and we will frame up short scenes um, related to each of those. Whoever wants to go first, maybe Aubrey, since you've done this before. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, is it? Should I? Should I use the same one, or do I come up with something different? It's a different city, but you can. You can, it could be the same, like fiction, I guess, if you want. Yeah, same idea. Um, yeah, I think so. Opry was a former. Uh, she worked in a circus, and um, and so in the old. Uh, what was the what was the last town that we were in? Uh, you were in uh, you were in a city called um, Ashpultan, which is very far away. Most people haven't right. heard of it in Eagle's Reach. So. Um, and there, her fire was at a um, at the elephant ring uh, that uh, she would go into this elephant ring where they you know uh, they train the circus elephants, uh, and she just sort of um, there's a fire where where the guards and the you know the the keepers would sort of sit and uh, and, and just watch, uh, you know, watch their, their stock. And so uh, she'd go there and that would ground her and she would see these elephants that would uh, sort of remember her across these different time periods or seem to remember her according to her. Um, and so I think in, in Eagle's reach, I th I'm going to keep with that. Um, but I don't think uh, it's a circus. I think she seeks out some type of like zoo or menagerie or, uh, or tries to find uh, tries to find some access to uh, the um, uh, maybe maybe she's looking for any kind of animal companion at this point, um, and so she maybe heads out into the woods uh, and just starts a fire and sees what comes. Nice. So you actually go out into the woods light a campfire and then wait and see like what kinds of animals or creatures show up and you i assume you interpret that as some kind of sign from the shadows right right as, as if their coming is the, the fire is the invitation for them to remember mm -hmm. yeah interesting um interesting that the animals would even approach right i think that says something too right. um good so we have a custom move here and i'm going to go ahead and just paste the text of it in here in the text um the formatting is a little weird, so I might actually. Uh, I'm going to mute you real quick, Aaron. Right? Every time you touch your, every time you touch your your earphones, there's a right. static. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to post the text of the move somewhere else too, a little easier for you guys to read it because it's an important move. Um, let's put it. I'm just going to make it a doc in that folder. in the folder if you guys want to follow along. When you spend some time in contemplation near the fire that anchors you to this world, roll plus wisdom. Uh, we'll do the fiction of this in a minute. I'm going to get the roll on the table first. On a 10 plus, you choose two from the list below, and on a 7 and 9, you choose one. Um, go ahead and roll that for me, please, Aubrey. That was a four? <laughs> yeah, four. Great. <laughs> um, Fantastic, I love it. Uh, let's let's hold that thought. Go ahead and mark an XP. Oh, there's, a, there's actually a miscondition, so um, we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. But go ahead and mark your XP and we'll come back to it. I want to talk to the next person about their anchor fire. Whoever wants to go next. I can go. Please do. Um, so I think Corwin has found a uh, a graveyard in the city, actually the the oldest graveyard in Ingle's Reach, mm -hmm. um, and there's a, a crypt in it. 
that he's managed to find his way into. Um, and there's, for whatever reason, like a, a a lantern or chandelier type thing hung in the middle of this crypt. It's not lit, obviously, but he he brings uh, candles with him and lights them, and he has uh, with him. I think the like the one personal item that he had when he sort of came to himself in a mental institution and broke out, uh, which is a deck of uh, tarot cards. Mm. They aren't set up as normal tarot cards, but have just like a series of, of portraits in them. Uh, one of them looks very much like him and the other people he doesn't recognize. Um, but they're sort of, they're weirdly cold to the touch and glassy. And I think the way that the the light reflects off of them as he, he lays them down in a pattern. Uh, it's almost like the cards he isn't looking at are, are moving and, and like whispering things to him. I love it. Uh, roll plus wisdom, please. Let's see. How's my wisdom? Oh, terrible. Okay. Um, uh, that's a four. Uh, popular number this morning. Mark an XP. Let's go ahead and do yours. On a miss, the shadows whisper a death prophecy about one of your companions. Ooh. You hold one. This hold can be spent per the visions of death move. Uh, that's, I'll explain to you guys if you decide to do it. Except both you and the target of your prophecy get one XP. So the way this works is you receive a prophecy. And I think... Whenever you reveal it, I want you to tell us what the card was too, okay? And how okay. you know, and how you know the card. Maybe like you flip the death card or something, and then you flip the next card that tells you like, oh, this is such and such in the party, right? So I want to know what that card is. You can make up, just make up a, you know, some kind of fortune telling card if you wish. Uh, but in any case, the way it works is whenever right before one of your companions does a roll, you can tell us out of character that this was what the shadows whispered to you. Uh, they whispered to you that this person is going to, this might be how they die. They are going to die. <laughs> and um, you'll both mark XP. And then if that person rolls a six minus, they go straight to last breath. So. Oh, all right. And it's uh, it's before they roll? It's before they roll, yeah. Okay. Um, and indeed, Offer, you got a similar thing. You, um, I think you are visited by some kind of wretched animal. Um, you're there with your campfire and you know, the, the shadows are playing on the trees and, uh, and, on, the, and on, the, on the foliage and on the grass. And often it's something like a, you know, an owl roosts you know, in a branch or, or like, a, um, like some kind of like, you know, stray dog or a fox or something, right? Kind of like comes and creeps about around the periphery. That's how you know that the shadows are, are communicating with you. But in this case, it's a wretched animal of some sort. Anybody have any ideas what kind of wretched animal? And I mean like it's wretched like in both its, it's maybe it's, I think it's just a wretched condition in some way. I mean like an emaciated vulture of some sort, like, I like that. that clearly needs to like feed. Yeah, I like that. And I think what it does is you're there by the fire and you just see it. You see this carrion bird crawl out of, of the foliage. Um, it's, uh, it's wings appear to be like, like missing a bunch of feathers. Um, and so it can't take flight. It's just sort of dragging itself like across, across the, the dirt. Right. And it drags itself up to the edge of the fire. And the whole time it's dragging itself up to the edge of the fire, it's just making this like really terrible noise in its throat, kind of like a and, and its beady black eyes never break contact with yours. It's just looking at you. And um and instinctively, you, I think you like bend down and the thing raises its sort of like featherless scrawny neck um, and it whispers something to you. And, whenever, and, and per the move, whenever you wish to tell us, uh, it, whispered, it whispered a prophecy of death about one of your companions. 
Who wants to go next? Uh, Nicolo can go next. So what I envision uh, for Nico is uh, something technological. Uh, copy link. I imagine that this is something in his workshop, in his like underground workshop. He has like this like uh, bowl, bowl that contains fire, except that it also shoots fire from this like black exhaust pipes. And because his entire workshop is like full of bookshelves and other stuff, there's like plenty of shadows just everywhere. And at the beginning, the first time he was using it, he was like very, not very sure what to expect. Uh, so he, so to make things worse, he added some, something to make the fire blue. So it's like shadows and the blue fire. And he just sits there just watching directly into this like eye, eye on the ball. I like it, yeah. Just to describe the picture for anybody who's watching this, it's a sort of like round iron, uh, very steampunky, like kind of uh, like a round sort of vessel with a glass door, right? Um, yeah, the picture is described like an old naval mine and a, and a fireplace inside an old naval mine. Yeah, that actually makes that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, fabulous, I love it. Go ahead and roll plus wisdom. Uh, yeah. Mm, submit. Yeah. Well, I I guess it's gonna be the session where we all die. <laughs> Did you also get a miss? <laughs> of course. I love it. Um, I think... does that count? To, does this miss count toward experience or not? It, uh, yeah. You, yeah. You always. Yeah. You get experience right now just because. Yeah. Just for getting a miss, but. Um, <laughs> I think normally you, sometimes when the shadows whisper to you, it's a literal whisper, right? Like some, oftentimes during these anchor fires, you sh it's about interpretation, right? That's, that's kind of what Corwin just did with the cards, right? But sometimes the shadows like literally whisper <laughs> um, to you. And sometimes you can hear that whispering coming from your fire, right? But in this case, it's not a whispering. It is a scream, a yell, echoing throughout that metal vessel, right? Almost like mm -hmm. almost like someone's trapped in it suddenly, right? And burning. And I think you run, you run up to the glass and you look inside, and that's when you see it. You see the scene play out, right? So Yeah, with little fires just being like moving and and being like people. Right. Cool. Precisely. Well that just leaves you character whose name I have momentarily forgotten. Shep. <laughs> it just leaves you, Shep. Yeah. Um, so I think what Shep does is he will climb a tree and take a little um, bit of, you know, a little stub of wax candle and uh, get, get the bottom of it soft and melted and then stick it behind either some leaves or needles depending on <clears throat> what the tree is and then light it and watch the the shadows play on the other side of the leaves or needles does mod do anything during this time mod sits like really really quietly and just stares at the fire too as if she knows what's going on is this like the only time that mod is like truly like sort of like I don't know, like quiet or at peace. Like, is this the only time that Maud is like, like, like does she almost like become a different creature when the fire is lit? Um, I think Maud is generally pretty, pretty quiet just because she's getting along in years. Um, but Maud is even when Maud was young, Maud was very attentive to the flames. So even when Maud would have been very rambunctious um they weren't when the flames were happening <clears throat> indeed indeed roll plus wisdom four is a popular number <laughs> Uh, 
you are not receiving much from the shadows. There is, you're mostly just hearing the hooting of owls, the, the whisper of the wind through the leaves. Late summer, you know, late summer, early fall day, right? And we have mentioned that Maud has a sort of, is able to vocalize, right? Um, that like, she has a limited, like almost like a childlike limited ability to, to. Yeah. Hear, right? Yeah. Like in, in normal circumstances, she's limited to like, like a single syllable pretty much. Maud raises up on her hind quarters or haunches or whatever she has. And she turns and looks at you and you see that her normally glassy black eyes have become like people eyes. They're like white with pupils, right? And she begins speaking in full sentences. She begins just, at first she begins like reciting what seem to be like the lyrics to a song or a poem. And then she moves into a history of this land. And then she ends with quite a detailed, quite a detailed statement about how one of your companions is going to die. And then she sits back down, crosses her arms, or, you know, kind of nuzzles up next to you and goes back to sleep or goes to sleep. Has she ever done that before? Uh, yeah, it was a long time ago. Good. What happened then? Uh, that was right before she nearly got killed by the monster and won't, like, fight monsters anymore. Oh, I see. So right before she had that traumatic moment, she did this little outburst, like that, this this loquacious outburst, right? Right. Yeah, she basically, like, described the companion. Um, and when that moment came to pass, like, uh, she threw herself in the path of the monster that was going to kill the companion mm -hmm. and got savaged herself. Um, but the companion lived. Fabulous. Let's have another scene or two and then we'll take our break. So it is, I think it's early in the morning of that, of that day before the first performance. So re remember that two day window we're working in and it's early in the morning of that first day. And you all have agreed to meet at, um, Oh, fuck it. You meet in an inn, right? Let's get, let's, let's do it proper. <laughs> You meet at an inn. Uh, let's name the inn. Someone give me the uh, someone give me the adjective, and then someone give me the alliterative noun that follows. Whoever wants to do the adjective, throw it out there. We're in a high up kind of town, right? You are indeed. Yes, Eagle Reach is very high. Is it windy? Oh yes. Then something about wind. The windy something. All right. Give me the alliteration and the noun. Someone else. Welp. The Windy Whelp, good. <laughs> Makes you want to know like how they got that name, right? Um, <laughs> just a just a street urchin that crawled in there every now and then and farted constantly or something. Who knows? Um, the Windy Whelp. You are there. Uh, you are having your breakfast. Um, it's a very it's a it's actually a nicer breakfast than you can get in a lot of towns and cities because Eagles Reach is a place with with. Uh, with commerce, right? Um, I think it's like, you know, fat sizzling sausages, actual like fresh eggs um, and bread, right? And and milk or water or whatever, right? And you're all sitting around having your meal. This might be a good time to reflect on flags. Um, just kind of start thinking about flags and keeping flags in mind. Um but otherwise, I think I just want to have this scene because you guys are, your sort of primary goal is what, what the hell's going on at Ledger Domain. Your secondary, but also very, very important goal is actually find this rumored magical artifact that Corwin mentioned, um, allegedly hidden by a long dead wizard named Skilter Rune. So 
Uh, I think I just want to have that scene for a second. Um, I'm going to go refresh my coffee. It's not a proper break yet. But I'm going to go get my coffee, give you guys a minute to think about the scene. I'll be right back, okay? So Patrick, a question to you. How do you envision us triggering this, like help me uncover details of my shattered past? Um, well, you know. Uh, do you want us to create like a, a piece of your of your past and just present it to you? Or how do you want this to play out? Uh, yeah, either way, you know, like uh, Opry did that sort of mind reading last time and, and gave me a little uh, piece of like a cultural dance. Um, so you can you can come up with some fragment and I'll I'll try and find a way to incorporate it, um, or or you can just uh, you can come up with like a, a leading question or a prompt and say like hey I think this word or this phrase triggers something in your memory, and I could try and come up with it. Either way works. Does that make sense? Yeah. Pablo, I think that Opry wants to, uh, no offense, call you a coward to uh, get you to follow me into a dangerous situation of some sort. And yeah, actually, that's fine. and maybe we can tie this in with Patrick too, and do uh, just we're just going to pick some pockets. It's like a like a competition, like whoever can pick the most pockets in you know in fifteen minutes, um, like gets uh, you know. The, the the loser buys buys the first round or something like that. Nice, <laughs> like it. I th I think like how that how that all starts is I just let Maud on the table to like finish my plate, but then she starts to eat off of your plate. Uh, um, who who do we need to call the coward? Oh, Nico. Nico. Yeah, and uh, she, so Maud starts eating off of your plate, and like. You try and like grab for it, but like she growls at you, and you like pull your hand back, and like Wait, is this is the scene minutes. happening? What's going on? No, we're, just, we're getting it. We're getting it. We're getting it ready. We're getting it. Right, I love up. it. I love it. All right. Well, I'm ready. In entertain me. Role play. <laughs> so uh, Opry was trying to lean into um, Pablo's "call me a coward" thing, and we're we're trying to set up a uh, pocket picking. Uh, contest to see who has to pay for drinks. <laughs> I'm not sure if pickpocketing contest is the, as a dangerous situation, honestly. Could be. It depends on who you pickpocket, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are we like pickpocketing the, the, the city guards or what? Yeah. Drunken people in a weapon laden society is always dangerous. <laughs> they, well, and anybody who gets drunk in the morning is probably dangerous, right? So, <laughs> yeah. It's like 8 a.m. right now or 7 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> really, really. <laughs> There's like a, a, a private room in the back of noblemen that have just walked in or something like that. And so that's that's the mark. Like you have to pick one of them before they make it to their room. Mm -hmm. I like it. I like it. That's pretty good. Uh, yeah. yeah, this is good. Um, I, I like it just on screen. I don't think I need any rolls here. Um, unless you guys are legit trying to like also steal something, in which case we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go to tr tricks of the trade. But yeah. Um, but that's good. So yeah. So t explain this contest to me. How's it going? All right. So uh, Dave, do you want to um, start with mod? Oh yeah. So how it, how we like came to this, I think, is everyone was just eating their breakfast, and I had finished uh, what I was going to eat. So I just I was just letting Maud eat what what was left on my plate, and then Maud started to help herself to what's on Nico's plate, and uh, and Nico's like about to try and get it away from her, but Maud just like growls and he flinches and he flinches back, I think. Which which sets up for uh for you calling him a coward or something. Yeah. Shep, can you just like take take this uh, dangerous beast off the table? I don't I don't want it to bite me or something. I'm not the breakfast today. 
Oh, Nico, I thought you were. I thought you were a thief. You're 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 too scared to take a uh, to take your own scraps from a from a whatever this mutt bear. What what is this thing? What is what is this mod? It's called a grumbler. A grumbler, yes. It's aggressive. It has like a huge teeth. Do you have you seen it in in its mouth? Like, oh no, mod sweet. Here, you want some bacon? Who wants some bacon? <laughs> <laughs> And Maude will like roll over onto her back for bacon. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> I, a wise man knows when to pick a fight and when not to and when not to pick a fight. That's I my line, line of, of reasoning. Oh yeah, I know something you can pick. But uh, let's, uh, let's see. Opry looks. Well, so to be fair, Nico is an artificer. How does he do? So maybe maybe it's this. So maybe it's uh, Opry's like, all right, um, you're not a coward. Prove it. And so I just get up and I start like, I walk up to people and you know put my arm around them and just sort of like do the little thing and 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 pick a pocket and like, like I'm not a thief. Well, look what I just did. You got nothing. Come on. Most most uh, most. I feel I feel like I want to define danger dexterity on that. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> Because now you're doing something that's just really, really like I don't know. It's all it's almost golden opportunity territory. Not quite. I'll give you a chance to try to pickpocket here. <laughs> uh, what is this? Dexterity. Dexterity. That is not going to end well for me. But that's a six. Oh. But you... I will point out that part of this conversation was also uh, what was it? Uh, call attention to. No, that was it. That's right. Got it. Sorry. Go. You are. Um... Okay, one second. <laughs> so you are. Um... I think we've described it like a group of noblemen uh, have come in, right? You know they're noblemen because of their fine dress, but um, it's early in the morning. I think it's a little rainy out, a little drizzly. And these guys come in like with cloaks and hoods up, right? So you can't quite make out who they are, but you know that like they're they're rich, they got money, um, they're armed, um, and uh, one of their I think there's like a group of like say five or six of them, and one of the people with them is uh, he actually is wearing much like simpler, plainer clothes, right? And uh, you go up and you, you you know you make your little you make your little boast to the table, Opry. You go up there and um, the person whose pocket you're picking spins around and it's Lord Ashton. <laughs> and he has his arm around the po the poorer person who is Stenton from the masquerade ball. He turns and he says, excuse me. And he goes for his weapon, but he recognizes you, right? He says, you look from, are you, is this your way of getting my attention of playing a little joke? I was uh, a little jealous of, of Corwin the other night. If you don't mind my, if you pardon my, my being so forward. It's like, and he kind of like, he he's got his he puts his hood down. And he kind of like runs his runs his hand through his hair. Right. And he says, "Well, I can't blame you for being jealous. That's for sure." And he looks up, and that's when he notices the rest of you. Right. And he pushes past you, Opry, and saunters over to the table, and um, and he like kind of sits down right across from you, Corwin, and he says, "I was really enjoying." our time together the other night, but I must have had too much to drink and I passed out. I'm sorry, you sort of cut out there for a sec. Oh, I'll repeat it. Uh, what part, where did you, where did you, where'd you miss? Uh, I must have passed out, blah, blah, blah. Okay. He says, but I must have had too much to drink and I, I passed out. You were very, very kind, very gentlemanly of you to put me in a comfortable place where someone would find me. Well, and it was a party after all. One one goes to a party to do things to excess, don't they? Yes, I suppose. And then he kind of like slides his hand across the table and puts his hand on yours. 
And he says, you don't remember me, do you? From the party, yes. <sighs> I have a feeling we're going to see each other again soon, Corwin. And he pushes away from the table and stands up. I was hoping you'd say something like that. He says, this is my friend, Stenton. I met him at the party as well. He and I have gotten really, really close. Haven't we, Stenton? And he puts his arm around Stenton again. Stenton looks really sheepish and shy, right? He says, well, you lot enjoy your breakfast. And he looks at you, Aubrey. I've got my eye on you. And he continues on. What do you think he meant by do you recognize me? You don't, or you don't recognize me, do you? I, you know, I was trying to play it off as like, oh, drunken party, do you really remember what happened sort of thing? But no, that, that, I get really disturbed when that happens, I think. He's indicating there was something else there, right? Yeah. yeah. And I think it's, it's happened before sometimes, and it's just, it's, it's really unnerving. It's that thing of like, it's, they obviously know much more about me than I do. Right. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think I'd like to just go across the table now that your your little camaraderie has been interrupted. I'd like to go across the table and just find out what you're each doing and kind of how we want to proceed here with Les Um What's your thinking, Shep? Um, I'm trying not to take the lead on this, so I'm just, uh, I think I'm just watching for somebody else to, like, take the lead, and, and, and I'm just kind of trying to sit back and not not do that um so i'm just sitting here with my hood and <laughs> <laughs> watching and waiting well nika what about you well nika looks at uh, at opry felt attempts and he like stands out st 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 he like st stands up corrects his like jacket he says now if you excuse me i get to prove myself and uh, I imagine that the VIP room is just like somewhere in, next to the toilets, but but you know, dish the wall. So yeah. he goes to the toilet and we see him like that. Just looking around, that there's nobody. He takes out his like flask of of, of eternal moon now now moving. He like unwinds it. It's, it's, it's like a flask where usually people hold alcohol, but there but there was like some green liquid. Nobody uh -huh. in their right st 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 state of mind would drink it. But Nico just take a, takes a sip, and we see his body becoming like a little bit like see-through, and and he just like stands in front of this wall, and he like, and he just like pokes his head through the wall first, <laughs> nice. their over there, and then and then he just moves his hand to grab one of their uh, not pockets to grab one of their money bags that they have on them. So this I'm, so just to back up, this is happening after after. Lord Ashton and his companions and Stenton all go to that room, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. Well, I th are you going to try to not be noticed here? Of course. Okay. I yeah, I, I, I'm into it. I love the uh, the phasing through the wall thing is great. I do want a I want a dexterity roll to do this quietly to where no one notices you to find danger decks. Yeah. So far, we have five failed throws today. Let's see. Oh, not not submit. Wait, reroll. It's uh, eight, eight total. You're going to go unnoticed for sure. You are not going to be able to pick anyone's pocket, however, because, so I think this is probably, let's just say this was like maybe 10 or 15 minutes after they've already been in there, right? Mm -hmm. You're not gonna be able to pick anyone's pocket because I think you're a little too startled by what you see. You phase into the room and you see that Ashton and these other men, they are, they have Stenton in like in the middle of a circle of them. Mm -hmm. And Stenton's shirt is off where you can see the strange tattoo pattern all over his neck and chest and stomach. And these men are in turn, you watch it for a moment, these men are in turn rubbing their fingers across the symbols, uh, uh, putting their mouths on his chest, uh, licking and, and doing other things to sort of like, it's, it's very central, right? And Stenton's just kind of standing there looking really nervous and kind of shaking and his lower lip quivering. 
and and Lord Ashton's leading all of it, right? They these men are very fascinated by the stuff on his chest, and they brought him back here just to sort of like delight in Stenton. What do you do with that information? Uh, well, I get a, I get to prove that I won at least this competition. So I like take, take so I like take take my own like uh, pouch of money. Uh, like, <laughs> you just lie. Like, <laughs> yeah, I like, just like come to, the, come to the table and show the pouch, throw the pouch on the table, and says, "Yeah, so Opry, I got it." You are uh, exceedingly brave. Well done. Yeah, but I'm also really scared about what they are doing in the in this room with Stanton. They are behaving like really. Weirdly, have you noticed? Have you noticed the, all, all of his little tattoos that he Santa Johnson has on his body? Yes, they were quite, uh, quite intricately carved, quite beautiful, on a beautiful man. Yeah, all of all those men, including Lord Ashton, they're just like touching all of his body and all the all the tattoos. Ravish. I think. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Oh, really? A gentleman does not kiss and tell. <laughs> yeah, but that's weird. Like, I've never seen such tattoos. What if there is like another court that is that we are not yet, not made aware of, and if he's an agent? But that's just a thought. Someone might have to be able to spot lore about it, right? Possibility. I'll roll that. Yeah, go for it. Spell lore is intelligence, right? Yeah. Is there any? Do you have any other kind of like? Moves or anything, or is this just straight up spout lore? Oh, it looks like just spout lore. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, that's an eight. Ooh, can I do? Okay, so I have this move, uh, the heart's sorrow, and for one of my levels, I picked up spell for a weak heart, and so I get to look into someone's heart in search of a secret. Mm -hmm. Um, and spell for a weak heart is you find a secret pain in the heart and you take plus one forward when you act on that pain. And I'm wondering if maybe when Stenton uh, and uh, Lord Ashton came over um, that I tried to uh, gaze into this man's heart and see see what see what lay there and maybe were maybe I didn't understand it at the time, but now seeing or hearing this story, it's able to sort of trigger that memory. Mm. Stenton has been under the protection of Lord Ashton's family from the time he can remember, from the time that he was a child. And he, he believes that he is, he believes that he is the victim of a very powerful curse. He's a victim of a very powerful curse, and that, um, and that, that, and that Lord Ashton protects him from it. You were doing heart sorrow. I'm just going to say it was just. I'm just going to say it was like. I'm just going to use your. What was your your result on the die roll there? If if you, if you rolled heart sorrow instead, if you rolled wisdom instead, what would it have been? Uh, it's eight either way. Okay, either way, that's okay. So, um, you get to choose one now. You're muted, Aaron. Since we're in that planning phase now, let's do uh, the secret is presented with greater context. Mm. Stenton's earliest memories are being taken into dark rooms by older members of Lord Ashton's family, being told that he is a victim of a witch's curse and that they will protect him. And they do it by putting these tattoos on his body. And this has happened routinely over the course of his entire life. So um, 
while he's sort of figuring that out and they're they're going through the wrap up of the competition there, uh, when he says that they have Stenton in there like shirtless and they're doing things to him, I'm intrigued. <laughs> so I want to work my way over to that room. Indeed. What do you do? Um, is it a door or a curtain or it's a door? Yeah. Um, I want to try and like sneak it open just a little bit to get a peek in there. And if I can, like, I want to catch Lord Ashton's eyes over the, the like, shoulders of the other people. Mm. Um, if you're just trying to, like, carefully open the door, uh, that's a Defy Danger dexterity. Okay. It's not locked or anything. Let's see. <laughs> that's a seven, just barely. Um... You, I'm going to take the fiction here. You creak open the door very carefully. Mm -hmm. um, I think you probably, how do you, uh, you're a thief, right? You're probably very skilled in making sure that door hinges don't squeak. Like, what do you do to make sure that, like, the hinges don't squeak? So you can... um, I think I just have, like, a little pouch of, like, graphite powder in, mm. in my uh, doublet. And I just pull some out and sort of rub it on the hinges before I open it up. Nice. You... You manage to like poke your head in and you see now that whatever they were doing is broken up a little bit. They're all kind of sitting around a table. They're, they're laughing, they're chit chatting. They're having, a, they're having, they're having, um, you know, they're having like a drink. There's like, there was some wine in there. They're having some wine and, um, and stent on Lord Ashton's lap, uh, very playful, very like, you know, like very affectionate, very playful. I think like um, like kind of nuzzling Lord Ashton's neck, that kind of thing, right? So it seems um, totally fine, actually. And I think um, I think I'm good there. The complication there, just out of character, is basically that just like whatever you were trying to figure out is not really confirmed, right? You you see, yeah. but it's not really what you'd hope to see, right? Um. I think is just sort of a wrap up there. Like uh, maybe I do catch Lord Ashton's eyes, just give him like a, a playful mm. wink and then slip the door closed. When I go back yeah, to the oh, table. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, that's perfect. He'll look at you and he'll just be like, he almost will get, he'll like smile and almost like give a sort of like, this could have been you kind of thing. <laughs> Send you on your way. But yeah, I'll, I'll make my way back to the table and just sit down. And be like, uh, oh, oh yeah. Nico, that was a uh, real dangerous, weird stuff in there. I'll actually intercept you before you get back to the table. Oh, okay. If that's possible. Yeah. Um, and I just like stop you like away from the others um, and like put a hand on your chest and I'm like standing like really close to you and I'm like, Maud told me something about you last night. Are you Did revealing she? the prophecy right now? Uh, no, I think I'm more trying to just uncover details, of, uh, help him oh, uncover details past, about yeah. a shadow past, ah. but it's tied into that prophecy. What, what would Maud have to say about me? David, would you like a little bit of helpful out of character knowledge? Sure. Uh, Lord Ashton and Corwin look really similar. Mm -hmm. Huh. You are more connected to all of this than any of us first believed. You're central to this, and I need to know that we can trust you. Look, I'm here at the court's orders just like you. They have more secrets about me than I could ever hope to uncover up by myself. So, yeah, I'm on your side. I'm on the court's side. I mean... Don't get me wrong, Ashton's pretty cute, but that's just a knight's diversion, not a lifetime's plan. It may be more of a plan than you realize. Have you ever have you ever had opportunity to to shave and see yourself in in a cool bit of water, or calm water, or 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 a glass? Oh, I, I prefer a bit of a rougher look, but. What are you getting at? 
next opportunity, get get cleaned up as much as you can and get a glimpse of your reflection. And it might confirm something for me, but if I'm not mistaken, you bear a striking, striking resemblance to who we're here for. I'll keep that in mind. Uh, all right. Just be wary. Of shaving. <laughs> That's a good place for it. That was a good scene. That's a good place for a break. Let's take five. All right.
I'm carefully walking my line between between uh, squeaky creepiness and um, and unacceptability. <laughs> <laughs> it's a space I'll play it. All right. Um, can you, uh, before we get started, Jason, um, can you remind me what the preparation that we had was in relation to? Oh, um, so you, um, you always have like, uh, or you, right before a mission, you, you have like, um, you have like preparation that you can, there's a move called bolster and it gives mm -hmm. you preparation, right? Which basically gives you a bonus on a roll or in songs of the shadow or in vault of shadows or songs of the shadow court rather it lets you um it lets you do a flashback right a la blades in the dark right oh um, neat but uh i can't remember what we left you guys with last time i think you guys probably had like one to start i guess or... i think nobody yeah. used the one so yeah so you, you can all just have what left over whatever you had from last time you can still have it's fine so okay um because it's it's an abstract currency so just we just you you just show us how you were prepared for this moment right and then do it. So. so we will have one for the next two sessions, or we'll have one per session, so that you'll we have, know. You'll have we'll one. You have whatever. You, whatever I gave you last time, you still have that, and that's all you have for the rest of the adventure. So. Okay. So so no, so so not many flashbacks. Uh no no there were no 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 yeah, just the one. Um, cool. So I guess we're just waiting on David. Give him a minute. Um, I would. As we as we will move into planning, maybe our operation. I'm not sure how they want to do it. I would actually try to involve Opry in getting some information from her about about the circus, mm -hmm. and yeah. I and I would now like connect it with the planning of our operation. I like that. That's good. Um, just some out of character stuff, so you guys, or just some out of character. I keep saying that, but I'm not using it right. Just some information that you guys have while we're waiting on David. Um, just start thinking about in the in the daytime. You have free. You have total almost complete total access to the leisure domain, right? Or to leisure domain. The, the actors may or may not be there, uh, you know, practicing or rehearsing or whatever. Um, people, people will be doing their work, cleaning, preparing sets, you know, doing all that kind of stuff. It's, it's not quite a public space, but like if you go in there, no one's gonna stop you from poking around for a little bit, right? It's just until you start to leave, right? So it's not like you have to like, in the day, you don't have to like infiltrate necessarily, right? Now you might want to present a certain face, you know, but uh, but you don't have to like look for a way in or anything like that, right? Uh, nighttime is different. Nighttime, you would have to do more of a like more of a recon type situation. So I was thinking that maybe we have. Um... Uh, sorry, my name's uh, Corwin. Sabotage some kind of. Uh... Some kind of like um, stage prop, some like dumb waiter type of situation, and then Pablo, uh, sorry, uh, Nico gets called in to sort of fix it, and uh, and and it goes long. Nice. Oh, like yeah, that. that's, that's a good justification for being on scene. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. And you know, it's it's like you said, it's dress rehearsal for a play. It's chaotic mess in there today. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people are going to be moving. Like, yeah, like there's going to be people on stage. There's going to be the you know, there's going to be like the set people. There's going to be the 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 front of the house people like everyone it's just at chaotic activity right like like throughout the day um, okay well so that's great so with all that in mind um, David right before you got on I was just saying that like during the day you guys kind of have a run of the place right as long as you have just some basic reason for being there um, so uh, Nico you said you wanted to frame a scene with Aubrey yeah so maybe as we are all getting back to the table uh, Nico will say. So, Aubrey, I was thinking that circus and theater have one thing in common. It's all about entertainment of a large group of people. And I think you told us that you were part of the circus. So would you happen to, to have some particular skills in this regard that could be our our gateway into the, the theater? Were you just like, I don't know, just checking the crowd? Or were you just like sending some kind of thoughts to the crowd. I believe that they could use the same person in the in the theater. I 
was not a performer. I was a fortune teller. Uh, I work alone. I work in private. Um, but I do like where your mind is going. We could. Uh, we know that performers are a superstitious lot. Uh, perhaps we could set up some kind of uh, some kind of reading for uh, for those uh, you know day before opening night, uh, just to get a sense of how they feel. Yeah, that's 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 really cool, 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 cool idea. So, if you don't mind me asking, is that part of the, the reason why you left? Have you foretold someone failure on the stage, or or something? My conditions for my leaving were difficult. Um, I've gone back since. Um, the, my fortune foretold it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Is that seen? Or... Yeah. I... It's an interesting plan, pretending to give the the cast a reading, a sort of, uh, you know, just sort of like, that's that seems you know, like a thing. Um, I imagine. So a little bit of a little bit of digging, like just cursory investigation, will tell you that the woman I mentioned earlier, Prim Glamour, who is the leader of a cult dedicated to this old King Faunus, uh, she she has managed to make herself the creative director of the newest performance, the newest play being put on, and so she's there in kind of like a director kind of role, right? And uh, given her. Her inclinations toward toward mysticism and the supernatural. I think she'd be open to that. Possibly, seems like a reasonable guess. Does uh, how does Shep and uh, Corwin feel about this plan? <clears throat> so far, we have we're going to do like a, a a fortune reading, and that's going to justify <clears throat> Opry getting in. And then Nico was going to be helping out with some kind of contraption that they um, were having issues with or, or something like that. So I guess me and Corwin need to justify how we're getting in or. Well, um, I, I liked the, the sort of idea of Corwin going in as like a disguised stage hand, breaking some bit of like stage mechanics, which gets Nico called in. Oh, okay. That lets me and Nico at least like sneak around the place and look for anything physical evidence while Opry is sort of searching the mines and talking up uh, the actors and whatnot. Yeah, what kind of uh Corn, what kind of what kind of poisons you get up to? Um I mean uh, a lot of different types. The one I carry around is uh, Serpent's Tears, which sort of opens people up to further injuries. Mm. Okay. I was going to say, if they have... If they have, like, an animal wrangler or beast master or something like that, that could suddenly uh, catch... That could suddenly catch ill. I adore that. <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> so the plan is to someone is there fixing something that's Nico. Someone is there to wrangle animals after the animal wrangler is poisoned. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Someone is there to uh, do a fortune telling reading. That's great. I love that. Corwin, what was your? Are you just sticking to the shadows, Corwin? I'm I'm breaking things and poisoning people, <laughs> okay, and then, so, like right. searching through the shadows for physical evidence or anything that might be interesting. You are sticking to the shadows. I love it. Uh, that's fantastic. Why don't we go ahead and have the? Um, you can all be on scene, okay? Like I'm not worried about like you guys getting into the 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 opera house. That's not a big deal. Um, <clears throat> you can all be on scene, and I want to just put up on the image board, I want to put up like a side view of the legerdemain, of legerdemain so that you can just see like how kind of structurally it, it is set up. I have like, I have maps of each floor too, but I don't think we're going to need that necessarily. I'm mostly interested in the cutaway version just so that you guys can kind of see, you know, the number of floors and kind of like how it's kind of set up in a way. 
So let's put that there. But this is the side view of Legendman. And you'll see that like there's all the common seats uh, and then there is the balcony. Uh, there's a basement beneath, there's a storage roof. And then there's the back of the house where we have the stage. Uh, there's like a grid work of, of, of ropes and pulleys and things where different mechanical devices and stuff are lower. That's probably where you're going, right, Nika? Um, and then we have um, the different levels. These are all things that like you'll have access to, like you can find a map like this, right? And without even trying that hard. There are different levels of back of the house and there's a thing called the underworld, which is basically like old, old storage, like shit that they're not gonna need for a long time gets stuck down there, right? So um, that's kind of, and, and, and it's a sort of like U-shaped uh, theater, right? So I'm going to just put you all on scene. Um, I'm gonna find out, I think I just wanna go around the table, find out where you are each at, um, but at the outset, we'll say it's around like 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. At the outset, everyone is kind of like, we'll say it's like, let's say it's around lunch. So there's like a break going on, right? So people, like the performers as well, will like not be super busy. They'll just be kind of hanging around. But basically there are people working on sets. Uh, the front of the house people are cleaning and polishing things, getting everything ready. Uh, there is, um, uh, the place is being fumigated, so there might be like smoke, you know, like kind of uh, like a like a like a smoke kind of hanging, you know, like like uh, in the air a little bit. Um, there are the actors that are like in different states of dress. They're mostly not in their costumes, but some of them, some of them have like you know headpieces or like masks or things on, right, just to kind of help with the rehearsal. But uh, but no one's in full costume quite yet, and. And you'll also see like down near the orchestra around some of the musicians and some of the actors, <clears throat> there is a woman who is clearly like the center of attention, right? That's probably prim glamour. Uh, she's, uh, she's very pretty, she's young, and, um, and she seems very happy, very laughy. Like they're all just like having a good time, right? Just kind of, it's very camaraderie, right? Uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna put a picture of prim glamour on the board as well. Jason, do you mind if I uh, roll a Oracle of Hypnos? What does that do? When I enjoy a full night of sleep without interruption, I get to ask a question about a person, place, or an event, and then I roll with no bonus. Oh, uh, that's, oh yeah, sure. That, that's perfect. Yeah. And just to learn a little bit about Prim. That is a nine. Nice. Uh, will you just read the move to me? On a 10 plus, your dreams answer the question in a vivid and clear fashion. Take plus one forward to act on what you've seen. On a seven to nine, the vision is guarded and symbolic. On a miss, the vision is hostile and strange. Take minus one forward. So what's your question? Um, what's her deal? What's Prim Glamour's deal? <laughs> yeah. Is that a... Is that a uh, a kosher question. I love it. No, it's a great question. Uh, and the, you get the mid result, right? Yeah. So it's kind of like vague, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, you s you have a dream of prim glamour, and in the dream you have to just kind of guess at who she is because you don't you haven't seen her in real life yet. But the dream is this: there is a what appears to be a sort of like like a a temple sort of raised by time, like leveled by time, like just uh, half, cr you know, half crumbled walls, totally exposed to the sky, right? But clearly the markings of a temple, its basic shape. And uh, there are some like stone pews and prayer plinths, right? And at the very front of this space, again, very open to the sky and the sunlight, you see this woman, uh, she is, wearing like a long flowing uh, sort of like white uh, sort of you know flowing white gown and she has a crown of roses in her hair um, and she has a number of people standing around her these people who once you get to leisure domain the next day you'll recognize as some of the actors from the performance but in the in your dream they are all naked it's men and women 
They also have like crowns of flowers in their hair and they are standing around her and singing and praying and worshiping. And she turns to a sort of altar and they begin letting up like a, like a chant, right? Like this sort of chant that kind of begins to like lift up in the air. And as they say their chant, as they speak these words above the altar, there's a rift. And as this rift is kind of splitting open, we just hear like, um, like the bleating of some kind of animal, maybe a sheep, maybe a goat, maybe some kind of deer or, 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 or um, stag or something, right? Some kind of ungulate, right? There's some kind of bleating coming out of this like rift. Um, yeah. Just what are your thoughts, I guess? I think, I think this is something that I would share with the group. Um, and I think that this would be, I think the way I describe it would be, um, be on the lookout for, maybe I'm trying to spy, spy these people out in the, among the actors. Mm -hmm. So, um, so to identify yeah. uh, the, her potential accomplices or people that she has under her sway in some way, shape or form. I'm not, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, just sort of describe, um, describe the dream. Um, maybe I turn to, um, sorry, uh, Shep uh, in particular, who has a little bit more experience with animals, um, just describe the bleeding and see whether or not it's something that uh, he's familiar with. Well, yeah. and Shep, you've also spent some time, like, like it, you spent a lot of time in the woods and in the forest and nature and stuff too, right? Yeah. Yeah, like I think I'm really put off by like the fact that you can't positively identify what kind of animal it was, nor can you, <laughs> nor, nor is your, I doubt you could vocalize the noise you heard because like human beings can't make those noise very accurately. So no, it like, just comes off as a ca 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 ca, right? Like it's, yeah. it's a bleeding ca 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 ca, right? <laughs> like, and I'm like, I don't know. I'll have to get a look at what kind of animals they have around there and maybe that'll shed some light on it. Um, do you think it's possible you might know something about like this order that she belongs to this old king faunus because i'll tell you just like uh i mean it sounds like he's a sort of nature i don't know if deity is the right word but like there's a there's something like natural world nature spirit going on right i mean would the shadow court ever have like dealt with th this being before Possibly. I mean, this could be a spout lore situation. It could be a, um, I mean, I, th I think, I think we've set up a pretty reasonable spout lore situation if you want to roll spout lore. Yeah, sure. Well, and then you can tell me how you know. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll <laughs> so, try that. Seven. Hmm. So like I mentioned at the outset, a, cultural thing that takes place in this part of the world is that there are these kings and queens of old they had sway over the lands during ancient times right and many people in present day wish to recapture recapture the, the time of the old kings and the old queens right and old king faunus was the legend is the legends at least old king faunus is principally dedicated to um to music and joy and life um inspired by nature right a very pastoral sort of entity right he had sway over over the lands during a time of great sort of pastoral beauty and almost like a sort of enlightenment right inspired by nature does that make sense how do you know this well so is it like pastoral like 
like rural life or is it like yeah like like like, like, like forest yeah, like, life like a, like a like both right like a one like, with nature yeah like a one life. with nature kind of way right okay like, so yeah, not like, like both rural and and a little and, bit of both yeah. yeah okay this idea that like we find inspiration and love and 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 esprit de corps in in our connection to nature and each other right so mm -hmm. okay and your question was, how do I know about this? Yeah, yeah, just how do you know? Um, I think I've been, I think I've just been around long enough to have encountered uh, some somebody who venerated uh, this old king's vision before, mm -hmm. somebody in the circles that I run in. Um, and I thought that they were a little bit weird. Like yeah. I kind of got, I kind of got the thing with the animals, but I didn't get like all of the things he was saying about this old king. Yeah. But. That's good. Well, I think at this point I'd like to go around the table and just find out at the outset here where everybody is, what you're doing. Let's start with Corwin. Um, you can be so anywhere, anywhere in the theater you wish. So. Um, I think to, to start with uh, here during this sort of break time when everybody's sort of mingling, um, I'm, I'm in the main area wherever, uh, uh, wherever Shep is uh, trying to wrangle some of the animals for this show. Right. Yeah. I think, yeah, that's good. I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to say that like, if we're looking at the map, that's going to be like, um, if we're looking at the map, I think I think we're going to say it's like the f the first level of the backstage area. Basically, they have set up some like ad hoc pins for like these uh, for a bunch of like sheep and goats and pigs and things. Gotcha. Um, but I, I imagine uh, Maud is is far too um, far too into herself to be part of the performing animals. So I think I'm sort of sitting with her off to the side, and I have like a bag of cold bacon. Uh, and I'm just feeding to them to her, <laughs> saying like, "So, uh, Shep, I mean, he he said some funny things, like you were talking to him about about me, but you don't talk that much, do you, Maud? That Shep was just making things up. It's more bacon. What would what would Maud say? <laughs> uh, now that she's like normal, she's like kind of limited to like a single syllable response, so." Uh, but she remembers her visions too. I oh, think. does she? So she's like, no, yes, no. <laughs> <laughs> <Don't remember. laughs> Wait, so he, you, you did say no. You didn't say things. Wait, was Shep was making? No, you're very confusing, Maud. Maud, no. Oh, well, what, what, what is, what does Maud know? I've, I've more. <laughs> um, and she like, you know, she's got the little raccoon hands and she like takes it from you and, and like, then just like, then just like fusses with it, like in frustration. Cause she knows what she wants to say, but she can't, she doesn't have a way of saying it. Nice. You know how to write? You want maybe a pen? <laughs> she can't write. <laughs> so yeah, she I think like there's just breaks it and eats it or something, right? <laughs> yeah, she, yeah, she just like breaks it and is horrified by like the eat. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think there's just like frustrated interrogation yeah. going on. And to be clear, it would be kind of like a I guess it would be like a feather or like a quill. Um, yeah. fantastic. So but but you're otherwise just kind of like keeping an eye out for the animal handler, right? Um oh, have we not poisoned him yet? No, yeah, no, totally. That has not happened yet, yeah. Okay, then yeah, 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 yeah. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. Nico, where are you at? What are you doing? So uh, have we already had some kind of emergency or the or I just have to make, make I think one you need already. to make one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can be up in the grid if you want. Yeah. So I suppose we see we see Nico with his like toolbox in the, in his hand walking and uh, and looking like and 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 he's maybe already like tinkering with something to like break something, something falls on the stage, so that uh, he can say, oh, good, that I'm already here, I can fix this, definitely. So he, <laughs> nice. so we see him already be like unscrewing a crew, a screw, or maybe like cutting some cable with uh, big scissors, and then just like, oh, no, it was me. <laughs> nice. So basically, let's say that it was like a, um, I think they have like uh, this, 
a is it must have some sort of like fantastical theme because i think they have like a big like a big operational like uh like a like a big dragon right it's like a big red dragon kind of a big fat red dragon uh that has like operational jaw and wings right and um and normally someone goes up in there and kind of like operates it you know like they just they mm-hmm. physically sit inside the thing but uh i think like basically you caused it to come crashing down and some of the mechanisms need to be repaired now does that sound good yeah perfect and um, and of course, Prim and the other people there are just like, yes, please, please. Like you know, there's a lot of people who they who just they just assume or belong there, right? <laughs> so, and Prim especially, because Prim is not normally a part of the company, she has no way of knowing who belongs here and who doesn't belong here, right? So, unless she like you know starts interrogating people about it, right? So. Uh, I don't need any roles or anything. I think that's I think that's fine. I just have like one one more question because I'm I'm, I'm not sure if we already said that. What is the actual name or what do or or what is commonly known about the uh, performance that is about to uh, to happen? I suppose they have some they have some billboards or some or some town criers on indeed, town indeed. or promoting this. So what is like? It is a no a recently unearthed literary treasure called The Thinning of the Veil. So that's the so that's the big performance coming up, The Thinning of the Veil. Oh, OK. Uh, a grand operatic spectacle, allegedly. So fabulous, I love it. Well, so and we talked about what uh we talked about what mod is doing and but uh where are you actually at uh shep um <clears throat> like if we're still waiting to take out this uh beast wrangler guy yeah um maybe you're just talking to the talking to him right I mean, yeah yeah i think so i think i'm just talking with him so that like hopefully like when it happens when we take him out somehow then like they'll be like oh this guy already knows because the old one told him everything oh right oh okay so you're kind of like you're kind of like there chatting with him and being seen to be like connected to him in some way like you know yeah. what you're doing you know what you're talking beast, about beast master understudy or whatever uh, i do want to care i want a charisma i want to define your charisma on this because okay. i think that's um, i think that'd be interesting So seven. Seven. <laughs> Good. Um, hold that thought. I'm going to come back to it. Aubrey, what about you? I think Aubrey is up in the balcony um, surveying things. She's sort of positioned herself, and she's maybe just holding court up there and just taking a stream of people and, oh, like, nice. doing fortunes yeah, and... Uh, um, but also keeping an eye on um, some the entrances and uh, and you know seeing what she can see as as she sees it. Fabulous, I love it. Um, I need a quick bio break because I had a lot of coffee this morning, so I'm going to be back in just like one minute. Going to make Maud sick feeding her so much bacon. <laughs> She's gonna tell me though. <laughs> She's gonna try.
So Aubrey, over the course of the afternoon, you have invited all the members of the company up to, to do readings. It is, it's very sorts of like, you know, oh, I'd love to know if such and such loves me, this member of the cast, you know, do, do, do they feel the same way that I do? You know, it's very, it's very high school. It's very Melrose Place. It's very like, you know, you're getting all involved in their, their drama, right? Um, nothing catches your eye. The main thing you observe is that every single person who has come up to get a reading from you matches up with somebody from your dream. You recognize them from your dream, um, except one. One person comes up and this person is wearing a, uh, is wearing like a, like a little lamb or baby sheep costume. Uh, it's a halfling, it's a woman halfling or a female halfling. She comes up and she's like, bah, 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 bah. I heard you're doing readings for the cast. Indeed, how, how can I help you? I have to admit, I feel a little sheepish asking you to do one for me. Opera rolls her eyes. She and head just like, oh, <laughs> one day. Uh, she's like, I'm just kidding. And she slaps you on the back, right? And she's, she gets up onto the other side of the little table and she says, and she kind of, you know, kind of like does that little thing with her fingers, like she's excited, you know, tapping her fingers together, little short, stubby fingers. And she's, because oh, what lies in my future? Uh, it'll cost you. Uh, it'll cost you a piece of gold and uh, perhaps a, a few questions. Hmm. She's like, "Well, I'm. Uh, I'm currently not. I don't have my coin purse on me. Nowhere to keep it. You know, here uh, within this little little getup. But I'll get you later. And I have nowhere to find you." She's like, indeed, indeed. And she kind of like leans in and says, kind of funny, huh? Like, you're just here reading fortunes? It is a service that I provide to the community. I am an entertainer myself, and we are all a uh, superstitious lot. Ah, uh, indeed, indeed. I've heard that about actors. I mean, yes, yes, actors are very, very suspicious lot. Yes. Are you an actor by a trade? I am, yes. But of course, because of my size, I get stuck with roles like this. Oh, you are. we need a little piglet. Well, let's ask the halfling. Oh, we need a child. Of course, let's ask the halfling. That sort of thing, you know. Yeah, the unsung heroes of the stage. They provide uh, provide the percussion and the, and the bass, that which is uh, necessary, but poorly, poorly heard. Mm, I agree. I agree completely. So, what's in my future? So, do I get to just make something up for her, yeah, or do I? Do you, want. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't... Uh, you don't I... give a shit about her future, right? <laughs> <laughs> then I think I tell her. Um, I think I tell her that she will trip on her first uh, on her first time out, but the rest of the performance will go uh, swimmingly for her. It's like, huh, I'll trip. That's weird since I'll be on all fours. That would be pretty clumsy of me. A little bit. It's, uh, it's a little embarrassing for somebody who has such experience uh, playing these roles. Mm. Well, splendid, splendid. I couldn't help but notice that uh, you arrived with a few other people, or I saw you out on the street. Um, what's uh, do other folks? You just Are you part of the... Just hangers on, junk groupies. What what is this? Uh, roommates. We are boarding together for the for the time being. Oh, I see. I see. I, however, could not help but notice that you do not have uh, a group. You are by yourself. Mm. Yes, I suffer. I suffer dreadful amounts of discrimination because of my size. You see, the the normal size actors won't have anything to do with me. It's awful. Hmm, I understand. I had a good friend who uh, had a similar condition, but was not quite a half playing. Um, 
Uh, Lord Ashton, perhaps you've heard of him. Do you mean Lord Ashton or Lord Gall? I don't care. Uh, who, who's the one who has, who's, um, whose mansion were we in last uh, That was last Lord session? Gall. That was Lord, Lord Gall. Gall. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. You can start um, over there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, perhaps you've heard of Lord Gaul? Oh, yes. Yes, Lord Gaul. Yes. Very, very, very short. Yeah. Absolutely. She's lying. She doesn't know anything about Lord Gaul. <laughs> <laughs> well, this well, has been really wonderful. I was hoping that I was hoping that you'd reveal something more interesting. Like I would I would stumble upon a fantastic treasure or something, but I will. I will take my. I will take my advice and try to be careful when I crawl out onto stage tomorrow night. When I um, when I uh, go to sort of dismiss her as she's dismissing herself, can I use a, uh, a bit of focus to establish a telepathic connection with someone that I touch skin to skin for up to an hour? Oh, uh, sure. Yeah, it, it, it won't be so two way because she doesn't know you're in there, right? But you might be able to like. Uh, I'll, I'll let it be the justification for like a, a discern realities. I think if you want okay. in the future. So fantastic. Um, just straight away, I'll tell you that she's there for duplicitous reasons. So <laughs> in case it wasn't super obvious. Yep. Uh, back to you, real quickly, Shep. You are you are down there talking to the animal handler we'll name him uh his name is going to be grit of course his parents didn't name him grit and he he's an older man like you so you're bonding off you know just being old and suffering dreadful amounts of age discrimination from the cast right and you're chatting you're doing your thing <clears throat> that's all going well and you're getting what you want like i think a couple of like someone walks up and starts talking to the both of you about the animals as if you both right are involved in that right um all that's all that's great the back pen area there is a a little makeshift like hut i guess for like chickens or whatever because there's gonna be chickens in the performance as well so there's like a little coop right um, near the pen where all the pigs and sheep and things are. And but there's someone in the chicken coop. There's definitely someone in the chicken coop. Like you have heard them. You have, you have spied a curly lock of hair from the little, like a little window in the coop. They're trying to be hidden, but you can definitely tell there's someone in the chicken coop. What do you do with this information? Like I keep trying to like, like get the other guy grit to notice it too like like i just keep like darting my eyes over there does he seem to notice or care uh he'll see you making that weird eye contact with the chicken coop and he'll be like uh is there, is there something wrong with the chickens uh, uh well there's there's somebody in there with the chickens what the chicken coop is so small how can someone be in there <laughs> I don't know. You've got halflings running around here. Like, uh, I, and he's like, <clears throat> it's just, uh, he's kind of looking and he's, uh, he's like, not seeing anything. And he'll kind of look back at you and he'll say, he'll just go, he'll jump the fence and go over to the coop to try to, and stoop down to try to see what he can see inside. Right. Um, and he like turns and looks back at you and he says, there's someone in the chicken coop, like whispers it, right? <laughs> and I'm just like, I think they know that you're there. You don't have to whisper to me. It's a tiny chicken coop. And then you hear like some like awkward, like, oh, 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 oh my, oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> how, how did I end up in here? <laughs> and, um, and uh, 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 indeed, a halfling, a male halfling, uh, like crawls out, looking a little sheepish, crawling out of the chicken coop. Um, and he's got like bits of hay and things in his hair. And he's like, "I was, I'm so sorry. I, I, I lost something, and I, well, 
you know, halflings, we end up in the, in the we end up in the silliest, most unimaginable of places. You know, owing to the fact that we're very, very small, we fit easily into things. All right then, and he like crawls out and says, "I've got to get back to work. You, you two, good job with with the animals. Fantastic work. Keep it up." He goes and he tries to dismiss himself. I'm just like. I, I just like I think I just like grab him like you know by the collar or whatever. I'm like, no, no hold on now, not, not so fast. We're gonna come from that. Yeah. <sighs> Nico. Because you're up in the grid, you have a good eye on things, right? You can see things that no one else can see, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I just want to throw that out there as a sort of like while you're up there trying to like rehoist this thing and fix, you know, and and get it like put back into position or do whatever, uh, that you actually can scan the room and keep a really good eye out on stuff if you want to do it in certain realities. I don't normally like throw that on the table like that, but I just want to make it really clear like your circumstances. You have a great view of the whole back area, right? Uh, yeah, but uh, hmm. Nico thinks that if that if anything is hidden here, like an ancient wizard artifact, it will not be out in the open. So, so he just probably uses the first uh, occasion to just say, "Oh, I need some piece of wood and and some new uh, and some more screws." Yeah, I'll check the storage. And 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 and, and the first occasion there is, he just goes for the roof storage and just will do a thorough search over there. <laughs> <laughs> of the roof storage, good. Yeah, I like it. That's good. Yeah, because in Nico's thing that if a wizard hits something over here, it must be like hidden. Yeah, yeah. So the roof storage is um, it's actually kind of like a um, basically it's it's mostly this right that prevents people from the ground seeing up on the roof right so there's like a sort of wooden facade you know that kind of is kind of high like a little wall right around the edge um also makes it difficult to fall off the roof <laughs> you know so which you know in the early days of the legend of Mains history you know sometimes actors would get a little drunk and fall right off right or crew members right so this little facade prevents that as well and so you can skulk around pretty much. I mean, you pretty much got the run of the place. There's not much, you know, um, there's there's really no one there to stop you and no one from the ground is going to see you, right? But basically they keep, um, they basically, it's basically just like a, like a, like a, there are crates, there are barrels, uh, there are like heavy tarps over these things so that in case rain happens, they won't get too damaged. Uh, they probably wouldn't keep anything that's like vulnerable to the elements up here, right? That kind of thing. But, um, you know, wood, uh, you know, uh, wood, like um, fixtures, like that kind of thing, right? Is, is what you'll find up there. Just as you're kind of like poking around. If you want to give me a discern realities role, though, I'll let you see if you can find something more interesting. Cool, yeah. Although this is my 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 wiki stat, but hey, I got a ten. Nice. Uh, go ahead and ask me one now, and then we'll come back for the rest. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess I will start. What here is not not what it appears to be. Hmm. Great question. So everything everything is basically like there are there are piles of crates and boxes that are kind of covered with like with like cloths and tarps, right? And if you poke your head underneath all of them, you're just gonna see lots of like very, um, just piles of like boxes, crates, wood, nothing super fancy, right? One of the piles though is actually a little different. Um, and when you lift, and you know this because as you approach, you, you see that the cloth covering over this group of items has like a like something's poking it like a like a like a spear or something or is a kind of or shaft is poking it it's kind of in a strange way i'm gonna cut away from that i completely didn't get it so there's like a shot there's like okay so 
imagine like several groupings of like stacked up crates and boxes and wood, right? Nothing super okay. interesting. And they're all covered by tarps, like cloths, right? Okay. Um, one of them has something clearly poking from underneath the cloth. Like there's a little yeah. point, something being poked at. That's it. Cool. Yep. I'm going to cut away for a minute. Go to Corwin. Um, Corwin, you, you may be kind of like on scene while Shep and Grit are dealing with this male halfling, right? Yeah. If you wish to be. Uh, you, um, you almost certainly see it taking place, right? What do you do? Yeah. So uh, I think while while Shep and and then the halfling are are distracting Grit and I Patrick feel terrible about this, but I am going to go up to basically Grit's lunch and dose it with something that emulates fast onset food poisoning. <laughs> nice, nice. I like it. Um, um, we don't need. Uh, I, I, I do I want to roll here. I don't know. Yeah, give me a roll. Define your dexterity. Okay. Uh, ten. Ten. Nice. It's gonna go great. Give just give me the scene. What does it look like? Oh, that's good because I don't have that as one of my safe poisons, so that would have been awful. Um, but yeah, I uh, I I sneak up to his lunch because you know everybody sort of had their stuff out, and then then Grit got distracted by by Shep coming up, uh, and I think he has like a sandwich or something, and I there's just this like purple liquid in a in a little vial that i pull out and just sprinkle some on the the sandwich there uh and then i think when the when the halfling runs off with this oh well fine get back to your thing um <laughs> they come over and shep is or a uh, grid is like uh distractedly chewing on his sandwich i think it's not like 10 or 15 minutes later before he has to run yeah. off indecorously yeah i love it that's perfect uh, I'm gonna get back to the moment with Shep and the halfling, but first I'm gonna get back. To, I'm gonna go to Opry. Opry, you have one more visitor in the afternoon. It's Prim Glamour. She comes up. Uh, she's dressed pretty similarly to how you saw her in the dream. Uh, she has the crown of flowers. She has a sort of wispy white gown. Uh, and she says, well, I hope you, I was, I was hoping that I might catch you. Um, would you do a reading for me? Absolutely. Um, you are a special patron. Pull out all the stops. Well, I, um, I have to say that I'm very happy by how well I've been received by by Leisure Domain, the company, the people around the company, like yourself. Um, I feel very lucky, very, very fortunate. I'm sure my cards are going to read very well. You've made quite a name for yourself. As I'm sort of uh, preparing the space for this reading, uh, can I pull out the Mind Flayer's Veil? Um, oh, yeah. give, give me some extra, extra, <laughs> some juice. extra mustard on this uh, yeah. fastball. Yeah, I love it. It's good. Um, I love it. Oh yeah, that's great. So you kind of put the veil on and it's like kind of, you know, very creepy and right. she, she kind of says, I'm very impressed by your sense of theatrics of drama. Maybe you should be in the show. I had thought about uh, being an understudy, but I, I don't have the voice for it. Hmm. Well, Madame, what do the cards say? Um, I think I start uh, like chanting something and uh, just something. Maybe I'm trying to, okay, so I think I'm just trying to like mumbling uh, some things, but then I remember some of the chant from the, from the dream. Oh. Uh, and I start invoking, like first it's just a word here or there to sort of pique her, uh, to pique her interest. Uh, and then maybe it's like a full phrase or something, something that I know that she's gonna like latch onto. And I just wanna see how she responds. Oh, nice. Oh, boy. This is probably Defy Danger Charisma, right? Oh, damn it. That's a 10 plus Charisma is a 11. Nice. 
you 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 say your words and you're looking behind you can you can watch her behind the veil right and see how she reacts without her noticing you watching her right which is a very clever move on your part and she as soon as you begin saying the chant she kind of looks at you and she smiles and she leans in and she says Aubrey you don't have to say anything else. You have made your intentions very, very clear. We are so close, sister. We are so close to bringing forth old King Faunus. Can't you see? My, my visions are not as strong as they once were. I, but I do, I do believe in you. How, how may I bring this, how may I help bring this about? I, I have the words, I have the play, I found it. I've been poring over it and we're, and we're definitely ready to do the performance, but it keeps mentioning, it keeps mentioning a prop that I can't find. I've, I've been, I've had people looking for it everywhere and I don't know where it is. They keep making reference to a gate, a gate, a gate, a gate. And I don't see anything like that. And I, and I don't know what it should look like. So I can't have the set builders build me one. I, it's the one piece of the puzzle I'm not sure about. This is good to know. Um, let me reflect on my readings for the day and uh, I'll find you tomorrow. Uh, see if, I, see if I've, I've seen anyone or anything that refers to a gate. She clasps your hands in her, her hand in hers and she says, <sighs> Sister, I can't tell you how happy I am to see you right now. I, I'm so, my heart swells with joy thinking about the restored reign of King Faunus, thinking about a new age, a new era of love and music and celebration. We are going to bring something beautiful into the world and it's so it's so exciting here with me. Juanis has already brought something beautiful into this world and it is your passion. Good luck to and, you. Yeah, she tears up a little bit and smiles and hugs you. And then she goes back downstairs. Let's take a quick five minute break.
So, Aaron, I was curious. Um, what does a Mind Flayer's Veil look like? We, uh, in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the first adventure, there was a, some kind of octopus-like creature um, that uh, we were tracking who was, like, manipulating this other character. Um, we chopped her head off, and I took her veil. <laughs> Nice. So it's actually like the tentacles and stuff from the wow. I don't. I think the Jason described it more as just like having like mind player juice on it, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it sort of like amplifies the uh, um, amplifies the power of my psychic abilities. So it's just a regular old veil that got some mind flare on it. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> That's pretty cool. We are we are the dregs. <laughs> Sounds like uh, that would really fuel some nightmares just being around that too much. Yeah. For for a short for a short period of time, I did have uh, the bone crown of old, old King Smule, and, uh, and and I lost that in a in a bargain with death. So, jeez, what are you doing with the bone crown of old King Smule? We got uh, we got kicked back there. We were. Uh, infiltrating some house, and uh, there was a trap on a door that transported one of our uh, one of our people, uh, Frazier, to um, to the uh, to that crypt that that you were in when you were fighting uh, Smeal back uh -huh. in uh, uh, Gauntlet Con. Mm. Nice. Yeah, it was terrifying. <laughs> it's a bad I believe <laughs> I believe two two four uh, I think everybody died uh two of us came back in bargains jeez it was a very violent uh very violent episode well with all these visions of death this one may come out about the same <laughs> yeah I, I gotta I gotta remember that yeah so you don't automatically fail. You still, you get a roll, and if you fail that roll, you go straight to the last breath, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah what's the? It's the roll of whatever you were trying to do, but the six month result is replaced with last breath. Gotcha. Yep. I sorry, I just heard part of that. So, <laughs> um, good. Okay. Shep. This little halfling is like, unhand me, unhand me. I, 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 I just, I, 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 I meant you no harm. I, I, I need to be on my way, please. Uh, I'm just like, Grit, do you recognize this person? A part of the crew? No, no, I can't say I do. He says, I'm just here with a friend. Just here with a friend. Well, who's your friend? Oh, my sister. Um, my, my my sister. She's she's part of the cast, and I'm I was here, I was here to to bring her, to bring her her good luck charm, which managed to escape me, and that's why I keep looking for it. Like, let's let's have it out then. And I look at Grit, and I'm like, you know, you don't believe this guy at all, do you? Like. You were you were eavesdropping. That's not good. That's not good for polite society. Grit's been munching on a sandwich and he says, oh, I'm "Sorry, I'm gonna leave. I'm gonna leave this one to you if you don't mind, Shep. I, I need to. I need to find a latrine." And he turns and goes away. Um. Yeah, I'm trying to decide how much I don't trust this guy. <laughs> um. I think I just like I stoop down and I push him back into the chicken coop and like follow up behind him into the chicken coop, and and I'm like, I'm just like, I'm, I'm still I've still like kind of got him by the collar and I'm like, yeah. you're gonna tell me what's really going on here? Who are you? Um, parlay. Your okay. leverage is the threat. Seven. 
He says, if I tell you what I'm doing here, you have to promise to let me go. Do you promise? I'm going to promise to let you go if you're up to no good, but you're going to tell me everything or else I'll hurt you very, very badly. And to, I guess, make a concrete assurance of that promise, uh, I will, I think, uh, I think Maud like wanders into the chicken coop and um, is like- Twist, her, twist the neck of a chicken. You know, <laughs> she's, like, she's like harassing, she like harasses the chickens out of there. And I'm like, Maud's, Maud's been a bit peckish lately. Could feed her some of your some of your little fingers, and I pull out a knife. Like I'm ready to do it. <sighs> he says, "All right, all right. Look, I, my sister and I are sneak thieves. We're we just we heard rumors. We heard rumors about about treasure that was left here a long time ago. That's all. Mm. People like me and my sister are a dime a dozen in this city." I, just, just let me go. She, she and I will be on our way. Heard about treasures in the Leisure de Mon. Really? Oh, yes, yes. <sighs> you are a dime a dozen every halfling I come across, I swear. It's just a thief and another thief and another thief. Excuse me, sir, but that's discrimination. Do you and? know how much discrimination is heaped upon my kind? Oh, uh, we're, we're, we're all thieves, of course, because we're small. We can fit into things. We're always where we're not supposed to be. As you're in the chicken coop that you found him in, right? Yeah, and I, I like, I like, put, I like, put the tip of my blade on his nose and just kind of thumb it with the with the blade, and I'm like, "You're not helping your your race's cause at all, are you? By being a thief." He says, um, my species, thank you very much, but I would insist you let me go, and uh, I've told you everything. I'm going to grab my sister, and we're going to be on our way, sir. All right, then. Don't let me see you or your sister around these parts again. Yes, 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 of course, of course. Okay. And then I, I grab him, like, one last time, and I'm like, just out of curiosity, what treasure did you hear was here? Oh, you know... Gold, rubies, emeralds, diamonds, things that sparkle in the night. It had to be more specific than that to get you and your sister both here in the Leisure Day Mon. <sighs> and he clearly doesn't want to talk about what he wants, he knows, right? And he says, you hear all sorts of things in the city, you know, all sorts of things. And I'll just like I'll just like put the blade against his little hands, and um, and I'm like, indulge me. I'm gonna cut there. Back up top to the roof storage. So Nico, you see this one uh, pile that kind of sticks out. I'll let you flip that tarp off and continue your search, and you can ask more questions. But uh, do you go take that tarp off, or what do you do? Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, that's the first thing. You could do to check out what he found. Yeah, this tarp is a little different. Uh, it's not it's not stacked with crates and, uh, and 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 lumber and things like that. Instead, there is a statue. Uh, it's a stone statue of like a warrior, I guess, and he's holding like a spear, kind of like to want to an angle, you know. And it's the spear of the statue that's piercing the cloth, and the warrior's feet. There are a number of of trunks and boxes that are kind of um, here and there. One of the trunks near the base of the statue is, uh, it's a small little chest. It's actually flipped open and you even mm -hmm. still see the lock, in fact, that was like somehow like, looks like it was sawed off possibly. But you see the lock like there and the little chest is flipped open. Um, there are a few things in the chest, papers and, and, and other little things. Uh, you can continue asking your questions if you want. Uh, yeah, as I'm, as I'm browsing all of the stuff, uh, what happened here recently? Yeah, you can tell that like this chest was was gotten into really recently, and the way you know that is because the papers inside there are like they're like they're like different kinds of papers. Like we can talk about what they are in a minute, but they're all like still quite dry and in good shape. If it had been opened like even even a week ago, um, it would have. Uh, 
it would have it would have been spoiled by the weather, right? It was raining a little bit earlier today, and so um, you can detect the dampness there. But they haven't been exposed to the elements so long that they'd be destroyed. Hmm. Yeah. So so. Uh... What here is useful or valuable to me? The, this little open one has what appear to be a bunch of um, a bunch of manuscripts or a bunch of scripts in that are not completed. Um, if you kind of flip through them, you're going to see they're just like they're basically just bound volumes of paper um, with lots of notes and things written in the margins. Um, and lots of scribblings and scratches. It looks like just the work of a playwright, a frustrated playwright, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's interesting. And as you kind of like lift up these stacks of papers, you will also see at the bottom of the little chest, there is a, a brass wand, like a, like a wand about a foot and a half or so in length. And it's very thin, um, and it's made of brass. What do you do? Interesting. I take the wand and pocket this. Oh, I take the wand out. I take a really good look at it. Uh, that's interesting, a brass wand. That's not how the wizards make their wand. They usually use wood. Why would someone use this material? So I have more. a... Think about more about it. Unless yeah, I have, a, I, have, I, have a, I have a better option. I have a move called Let Me See That. When I take a moment to, to, mm. to handle or examine something interesting, ask the GM to do the following questions. Go for it. Uh, I guess the first one I will fire is, what does this do? The wand is um, etched with very, very fine... Um, very, very fine etchings all along the length of it, which are arcane in nature. And you have a pretty good grasp of the arcane, right? You're an artificer. And this is a wand of fireballs. It shoots fireballs. Hmm. Well, I still prefer my ice thrower, but yeah, I will pocket this in. Uh, no, one, one more question. Uh, I don't think any of them will apply here. So I'll just pocket the wand into my toolbox and who knows, maybe it will come come useful. And I will just grab some some wood and some nails and go back to fix the to fix what I broke a, a little bit, and then maybe have the uh, have the excuse to go search some other area. Do you not want to ask your second question? Uh, uh, yeah. Mm, it sort of depends. If it's broken, then I can ask how how can I fix it. But I'm not sure it's if not. it's broken. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, okay. So maybe, what has been done most recently to this, with this or with this? <clears throat> so did someone like <clears throat> open the chest, place it over there to like stash it, or maybe I can yeah. figure that one out. Um, it has not been used in a long time, and you know this because. It actually has like a, um, it's got like a, like a, at the very tip, it's got like a smudge of like black greasy residue. And um, it looks at some point to shoot a fireball, possibly, most likely. And then, um, and then at some point it just got stashed away. Yeah, there, it's no, no recent use. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, so I would pocket the one and uh, go back fix the dragon a little bit and then uh, and then maybe engage with some other with someone else to help them or or go search other other area mm, fantastic so corwin your plan is going as anticipated <laughs> um, that's sorted no big deal um you even see grit go off, you know, um, not showing much grit himself with a stomach ache. And yeah, what's your next move? Where do you go? What do you do? Um, so you said we had seen like a basic map of this place beforehand, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
there's this whole area called the underworld and how could I not go there? Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, I think I'm wandering through looking for a door for it. And I think maybe, maybe the door has like some old prop pieces and stuff around it. So it looks like this portal of fire and it's got a big ominous sign, like welcome to the underworld <laughs> sort <laughs> of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's great. This is basically the opposite of the top side storage. Um, this is like, old sets, um, things that are painted, uh, things that might rust, anything that can't be exposed to the elements. It's just piled up and it's a pretty big space too. It almost looks like a, um, it's very dusty. I mean, it's almost like crawling around like an antique shop, right? Like there's just like crap, old crap piled up everywhere. Um, what do you do? So if it's, uh, and there's like a lot of stuff down here, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So if it's all old and dusty, like it would take way too long to search through everything. So instead, I'm searching for any signs that like people have been in here recently, like if something's disturbed or if some of this dust is like footprints in it or anything like that, just to see what's been done down here recently. <clears throat> I love it. Roll um, uh, divide or uh, discern realities. Okay. Is it a good place to call out the visions of death? <laughs> I would love that personally. <laughs> yeah. So, so I guess what I've seen in this in this in in my fireplace was exactly Corwin just like poking through a very dark place, which I then didn't know it was underworld. But so, 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 so maybe that's that, that's why I didn't warn him about this because I haven't been there yet. But I've definitely seen something jump on him over here mm, nice uh you both nice. get to mark xp so go ahead mark xp both of you <sighs> i'm gonna have you roll that with your party if you please yep so with my grand minus one wisdom that's a three a three <laughs> uh I, i'm sorry i just thought it would be like very narratively appropriate over here no it's it's the perfect time for it I love it. This is this would be a great cliffhanger spot, but we've got more sessions, so I'm just going to roll with it. It's okay. Um, actually, no, I'm going to cut away. I'm going to leave you dangling for a minute. <laughs> let's go to Shep. Uh, actually, let's go to Opry. Opry, you're in. You're in like Flynn, right? You've 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 you're you're there. You are part of the you're you're part of the conspiracy with with um, with Prim Glamour. So what do you do? Uh, At this point, it's probably like around 4 or 5 p.m. It's getting to be dark, or it's getting late. And do I know that the that this place is about to vacate, or...? Uh, it won't vacate completely. I mean, a lot of people live there, right? Okay. Um, especially when it's in season, but uh, but it starts to die down a little bit, yeah. And they lock the doors. Okay. So I think that uh, I'm going to take my newfound um, stability among this crew, and I'm just going to... I'm just going to walk around. I think I'm going to go try to track down um mod mm -hmm. in particular okay <laughs> um, to sort of um sh should i be concerned that um that prim thinks that that prim has also noticed my connection to these other people or no i don't think so i mean no i don't think so prim seemed really happy to meet you right so. uh okay in which case then i'll just go find uh well, who will I go find? Um, maybe I'll go find Corwin. <laughs> okay. Oh, you're going to go look for Corwin? Okay, yeah. nice. Uh, fantastic. Um, you might even hear in passing from uh, from Shep or somebody that like, oh, I saw him go that way or whatever. Right. Um, and the underworld is not like, it's not like, it's not closed off or anything. You can go down there freely, right? So. Well, okay, that forces me to put the ball back over from Corwin's court, doesn't it? But I'm not, so Shep. <laughs> <laughs> the halfling reveals to you that indeed he's heard tell of a powerful magical artifact, and that's what he and his sister are there looking for. They've heard the same rumors you guys have heard. Okay. All right, then. Well, don't let me see you again, or there'll be trouble. He, indeed, and he, he scampers off. Uh, where do you, what do you do? Where do you go? Um, all right. So, I mean, I'm, 
established here now in my role as caretaker of the animals or whatever, I'm going to have a look around at them all and see if there's, like, besides goats or sheep, like, see if there's any, like, more wild animals that would make a bugling noise. The bugling noise. What's that in reference to? To uh, the vision that... Uh, the bleeding. Yeah, the bleeding noise. Oh, it was a bleeding, yeah. I mean, it, it could have been a goat, could have been a sheep, could have been a, could have been a deer, like those, you know, that nasty noise that deers make, like, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I guess I'm, I'm just trying to take stock of the animals and, and see if there is, like, deer or take elk stock. or anything. Yeah. <laughs> We're all about puns today. Um, uh, there's not. Then what? Okay. Um... Yeah, so. Oh, let me help you. Not sure. You see Stenton wandering uh, around the backstage area looking confused. What do you do? Um, Sten he knows who. He, well, I guess he knows who I am. I don't know. I mean, you you know who he is because he was at the table earlier at breakfast, right? So, right, right. So, so you might nothing, and, and and you know he was involved. I mean, you were there at the at the masquerade ball too. You know, so right, yeah. Um, I guess I'll go over and like see. Is he with anyone? Doesn't seem to be. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll just like approach him and be like, Stenton, what are what are you doing here? He says, oh, hello. Uh, seems I keep running into you and your friends <laughs> the last few days. It is a terribly odd coincidence. Oh, I, I'm, well, I, I, I've, I've recently gotten a job here, um, and I was just trying to find who I need to talk to to get, to get started with things. Is that right? Perhaps I can help you. I've been here all day. Um, who, what's your job, and who are you looking for? Oh, uh, I'm... I, uh, kitchen, cook, yeah. mm -hmm. haven't escaped that circumstance in my life yet. But... So you're, you're preparing the meals for, for everyone after this, uh, dress rehearsal? Uh, helping, yeah, yeah, but I can't find, I can't find, I can't find where the, where the cooker is. I've had a look about the place, and I, I have to say I haven't actually seen a kitchen proper. Uh, there is going to be like a little corner where they have like a, you know, a little preparation area and a hearth or whatever, if you want to direct him to that instead. So. Yeah. I'll like bring him over there. And meanwhile, I'll be like talking to him like, well, who, who hired you? You're just looking for extra work or he's like, Oh, well, uh, uh, everything that happened at Lord Gall's, I, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't keep working there. And, um, and I met this really nice fellow, uh, Lord Ashton. He, he he he's he's been helping me out and um and he he got me this job but i think he's i think he's i think he's i think he's friends with the people who own the large domain oh well i haven't seen him about today but uh here here we are oh he oh he's he's here i mean he he just dropped me off a minute ago oh i see and now we cut corwin Hey. You, I assume you have a, you've grabbed a candle or something from up top and you're poking around. Yeah. And you, you order to what appears to be a, a wide, flat nook, niche thing where on the ground, there is drawn, but more than drawn, more like more like carved and then stained on the floor. A very intricate pattern all over the ground the floor. It is not dusty. Hmm. And but the but the inking on the carvings on the on the floor and the stone are um, is, is 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 not wet, so it's been this way for a while. Gotcha. But it's not dusty, and it. I don't know if it looks familiar to you because I don't know if you have seen Stenton undressed yet, 
but out of character, it is it matches the pattern on Stenton's chest. Gotcha. And, but nevertheless, it has your eye, right? How big is it? Probably like it occupies the space of like a small bedroom. Oh wow! Okay. And that's when someone gets the jump on you. They do that thing where they like grab your mouth from behind so you don't yell, right? Hmm. And it's Lord Ashton. You recognize him by smell first. What does he smell like? Um, he smells like like leather and sandalwood. Mm, it's a good smell, right? Very masculine, right? And he says, funny finding you down here. And he kind of like says, and he kind of lifts his hand off your mouth. Oh, and here I was just thinking how much I'd like to run into you in a dark shadowed place. He kind of turns you around a little bit and he looks good. I mean, you know, he's 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 groomed and, and smelling good like he does. And he says, well, ask and you shall receive. <laughs> and he he kind of like pulls you in. He like pulls you in for a kiss. Do you kiss him back? Yeah. He's kissing you. He's stroking your ear and your hair. And it's it's all really good. And he kind of like, he kind of pulls back and looks you in the eye and he says, it's just like old times, huh? You keep saying things like that. Do I like, know you from somewhere? It's like, oh yes, yes you do. And I have, been waiting for this moment for so long, Corwin. It's some days it's all I can think about. In fact, I knew something was wrong when you didn't recognize the name Skilter Rune. But that's neither here nor there. And out of character, Skilter Rune is the dead wizard. Mm hmm. And he kind of like leans in and he says, I just need you to say the words. Tell me that you still love me. And now I want you to roll your last breath. Hmm. Go to roll for your party. We'll worry about that. I'm not going to do the what does a black gate look like thing. I just want to see the roll. <laughs> That's a three. That's a three. Yeah, I was going to say, you could use your preparation, but it's not going to help. And he says, and what do you say? I say, um, I think as I look at, back to him and I like strip my hand down the side of his face, I look into his eyes and I say, I feel like I can never forget someone like you. And there's something familiar in those eyes, something, something I feel like I've known forever. And yet you will not say the words. I, I would love the opportunity to fall in love with you again, but how can I love what I don't remember, even if I feel the connection? And he leans in and he whispers in your ear, I fear that was the wrong answer. And you just feel a blade slipping between your ribs. And he withdraws it and he slumped down to the ground, bleeding out. Let's take a break. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the way I run Dungeon World, uh, Patrick, is you get to you get to apply your unspent XP to your next character. So any any unspent XP you get to put on whatever new character you make. Um, okay. But Corwin is uh, Corwin is 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 gone. Um, no. You can be listening along as you 
as you make your your next character, if you wish. Um, I'll, I'll leave that up to you. But we're gonna play for just a little bit more, and then and then we'll debrief. Uh, but let's take a break. Let's take five. All right. I feel so bad, Patrick. I, I just didn't know this was your weakest stat. I was going to look before. But, but this was just like perfect opportunity investigating called Underground. I, yeah, I'm just so sorry. Going through a fiery portal into the underworld, it, it really couldn't have been a better time for it. Don't feel bad about it.
Hey. So let's have a talk about that. Yeah, I, 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 in the chat, I proposed the idea of maybe come back as Lord Ashen. I'm not sure if that makes as much sense. It makes a certain degree of sense. I'd have to tell you a lot of the backstory. I don't know if I want to do that. So I'm inclined to keep it a lot of it secret still, but to it. What might be interesting too is coming back as uh, as Stenton as a possibility. Huh. Or uh, or a totally new character as well. So we get some halfling thieves running around. Oh, right yeah, I know. You could be, <laughs> yeah. Um, you could be one of them. Uh, they're not named yet, so you could name one and become one of them. Uh, that's if you want to make it somebody who's already in our fiction, right? Otherwise, somebody brand new is fine. It could be any of the actors in the company or the opera. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, exactly. So, so the new character, so the new character will be also a member of the, of our court, or just someone not connected. Well, they uh, depending on who you pick at the outset, they won't necessarily be connected to the shadow court, but that doesn't mean they can't get involved in shadow court business, right? Okay. Okay. Because the sense, the sense this is like this old shadow court. I thought that maybe his his new character could have like observed the death of the old character from the shadows. And oh, then, so now he's that's his, he's he's baptized <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> yeah. he's I'm not really sure. Just you know, just like shadow court can manipulate time. So maybe the the new character was just here behind the crate observing all of this, so that he oh, knows. Maybe he's but, stuck in a vault. Yeah, that's an interesting idea, actually. Hmm. Interesting idea. Well, in any case, well, you think on it, Patrick. Yeah, Opry. <sighs> you. On the way to the underworld, uh, you run into Lord Ashton. And he says, <laughs> I just keep running into you, don't I? Uh, our stars are aligned, Lord Ashton. Uh, that sounds like, that sounds like soothsayer mumbo jumbo. I, I used to do this, looking around at the opera house. You sing? You perform? I was a performer in my day. Hmm. What, what are you doing here? Oh, my friend Stenton. Um, you saw him earlier. Yeah. He's, well, after the incident at Lord Gaul's, he's having, he's having a hard time working there, and so I just got him a job here doing craft service, you know? That's, uh, that's very generous of you to find him employ uh, in a place such as this, a uh, beautiful space. Well, it's not the only job I set up to, if you know what I mean. Oh, is there anything that uh, me and my merry band can help you with? I don't think so. He's He performs his other duties in a very satisfactory manner. I, I'd imagine so. Hmm. <sighs> you never answered my question. What kind of performer are you? Um, I used to work in a traveling circus, actually. Hmm. If you if you ask around, I've been doing uh, fortune readings for our more superstitious members of the uh, the crew. That sounds pretty exciting. Uh, read my fortune. I'd be delighted to. Uh, yeah. So, what do you do? Um, you take him? Oh, how violent do I want this to get? <laughs> um, you don't know what happened to right no uh, I think I think I'd want to I'm, I'm trying I know that he's up to something so I want to put him on blast in some way and so I want to take him to the front like stage like front stage I want him stage center and uh, I'm going to set up like a card table or try to like lead him to a card table like direct him up to the up to the stage and, and make a big show of it uh, and maybe like do some grand like Lord Ashton how may I read and everybody's in on it right like everybody knows that like this is a part of what I'm doing yeah yeah I think a couple of people are like kind of milling around everybody everybody else in fact um, Nico and uh, Shep uh, and even Stenton you'll be aware of it too you can go you can go to like stage left or stage right and kind of watch this if you want right and he says I can tell you have a flair for the dramatic. As I said, this is this is my stock and trade performance. 
what is your stock and trade? And I sort of grab his hands and sort of pull him to me and sort of sort of like get get close. Uh, maybe I put the mind flight mind player's veil over my head again. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and uh, just trying to be here, not trying to like necessarily channel it, just uh, again for the drama of the, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. the drama of the thing. Um, and I think, uh, can I roll the heart's sorrow again to course, look into yeah, someone's definitely. heart in search of a secret? Yeah, yeah. That is a, what is it, seven plus wisdom. That is a, not going to be more than a nine. Nine. All right, make your choice. To choose one. I like this. The secret is something you could possibly know otherwise, however unlikely that might be. Mm. You see that he grew up with Corwin, and they were very much in love. And this might be something that Corwin realized and told you, possibly, is how you might know such a thing. But how does the reading go? Let's see how that looks. Um, I see, so I'm just as ostentatious as possible. Again, just like trying to draw everybody's attention to this person, because I don't think that he's necessarily supposed to be there, even if he's like a patron of the arts or something. like. Why? Why is he here? This is this is not. Yeah, yeah. He's definitely he definitely can't keep a low profile anymore, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, I'm egging him on. I think I see I see a lover. I see a lover in the a lover in the balcony, and I point to like some people milling about up in the balcony or something like that. Yeah. Um, I see a uh, I see a deep uh, um, I see a. a an, an open an open wound um, and uh, and so I like stare to like some some like broken crate in the background or something like that but again just sort of like teasing him out for uh, I see secrets uh, secrets hidden even from those uh, whom uh, you trust most and I just sort of end it there just like letting it sit awkwardly uh, on these these sort of more uh, uncomfortable um, connections. He will lean in and say, you're right. I have been suffering for a long time from a festering wound, but I have finally found a poultice to seal it, to heal it. That wound is closing up even as we speak. And he steps, he gets up and says, thank you for your fantastic insight, he says, and then just jumps off the stage and heads out the, heads out the exit. I think I shout to the everybody who's listening, Lord Ashton, everybody. <laughs> and start, like, clapping. Right, yeah, it's good, it's good. And under the, I think under that clapping, like I get the sense that maybe he, something happened with Corwin. And so yeah, yeah. I run. Run, yeah, you're heading, you're heading for the underworld. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Uh, well, and so Shep and Nico, you'll see Aubrey looking like a little, a little, like a little white faced, and you know, suddenly kind of like nervous and running back towards the back. What do you guys do? I will probably find. Oh, I need some more nails, and I will just like excuse, excuse myself from working on the dragon and just follow follow Aubrey. Yeah, absolutely. What about you, Shep? I just love the idea that like no one is actually like overlooking you, but you keep offering up this information to the room. Um, yeah, I think I'm gonna actually stay up here and keep an eye on everything. Whatever is going on, they'll sort it out. My other members uh, of our team will, but I need to make sure that like I keep an eye on what's going on around here. Yeah, you can roll to certain realities if you want. Okay, we'll get them to the table, and I'm gonna cut back to the other group. Nine, hmm. um, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna get Maud's help. Oh, nice! What does she do? Um, I like 
I like kind of put my arm down and mod like crawls up onto my shoulder, and then I like grab onto a rafter and mod crawls up my arm and gets on the rafter. So oh, nice. So she can keep an eye out. Yeah. Yep. She gets up in the grid. Okay, so that's ten then. Yeah. Uh, go ahead and ask one, and then we'll continue in a minute. Okay. Um, what's about to happen? Think about it for a minute. Yeah, I mean, you know the questions. So if you want to do their scene and then come back to it. No, I got it. There's someone up in the grid right now. Someone up in the grid, and maybe this, maybe you, you can describe how Maud gets your attention on it, but someone up in the grid is carefully sawing away at a sandbag. You know, one of the weights for the curtain and stuff. And there's a young, a young actor, you don't, recognize them or I mean maybe you've seen them around all day but you don't know anything about them otherwise but there's a young actor standing right underneath it mm. we'll come back Aubrey and Nico you are able to follow a trickle of blood to Corwin's body what do you do Hmm. I think Nico, however sad he might be, he's probably like quite practical. So he like carefully approaches, checks. I'm not sure if, if pulse check was 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 then known, but definitely he like he like checks if Cohen is, is still alive or not, and then maybe like closes his 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 eyes if they were not 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 yet closed. Well, so Corwin, do you want a couple of last gasps here before you? Pass beyond. Sure. So maybe you, you're, you're you're hanging on to a thread of life right now. So yeah, I think you you come up and you like feel his neck, and even though he's fairly cold, like his eyes sort of flutter open. Nico, Corwin, Corwin, it's going to be okay. Just 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 keep your strength. It's, it's not, but you have to know, Lord Ashton. You have to stay away from him. He's dangerous. Like, d d did he, d d did he murder you? <laughs> well, not quite yet, but give it a few minutes. Aubrey, what are you doing during this? I... <laughs> Aubrey is... Aubrey is hanging back. There's something about, okay, table talk. I'm trying to hit tell me a lie, I believe, for uh, Nico. And so okay. I'm, I know something's going on. I know, I know that there's, apparently I know of some past between Corwin and, um, and Ashton, and maybe that memory is like coming back. Maybe I have a better sense of that now. Um, and in the same way that I got on Prim's good side and I've sort of negotiated that relationship, I think I want to preserve whatever Ashton was doing as well. Um, and I don't want Nico to know that yet. And so I think when uh, I think when Corwin passes, I want to tell a lie about I I was with Ashton the entire time. This is oh. okay. I know I know it couldn't have been him. I You're think keeping he, it. Got it. There's someone someone is, there there's a shapeshifter around or <laughs> <laughs> a fantasy shapeshifter. It was those halflings. <laughs> it, was, it was those totally, totally competent <laughs> halflings. A shapeshifter. That's <laughs> that's a, that's a, before we go that far, uh, yeah. do, any 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 final words, Corwin? <laughs> um I think as as Opry comes up and and she's trying to like work through exactly how to work Nico in this, um, I, I catch her eye and I say that that dance you saw you said you saw me dancing. Who was I dancing with? 
you know who it was. <laughs> and I close your eyes, <laughs> whether you're dead or not. <laughs> <laughs> I think he sort of smiles and drifts off. And then do you tell Nico the lie about how it could have been Lord Ashton? I do. Yeah, that's good. Um, well, Nico, what, what do you think about that? Like, uh, Opry, I mean, Opry's pretty convincing. I mean, but how do you feel about this, the, who's not Lord Ashton? Hmm. But if it wasn't Lord Ashton, but, but Corbin said it was him. It's true. Corwin did say that. <laughs> he said he said be wary of him, and, and that yes, he he did me in. I think I say, look around. Do you see? Do you see any lights? This place is it's pitch black. How how could he have? How could he have known? I'll I'll tell you who I saw, and that's when I think I catch up with Nico about all the people that I met uh, earlier in the in the fortune telling, and maybe that's when I clue him into perhaps it was a halfling. Uh, maybe I point out some other sketchy people that I remember from my dreams that I sort of connected, like um, um, maybe there's some crossover there between um, Nico's vision for um, for his death, and I'm trying to like rope that into the story of, of, uh, of one of these other characters. Mm -hmm. Indeed. And so are, indeed. You pointing, okay. so are you pointing someone in particular as a possible killer, or just saying that it couldn't be Lord Ashton, it must be one of many others? I think I always say it couldn't have been Ashton. I, I, was, I was with him before the reading. Uh, I was teasing information from him. Um, we, were, you know, we, were in the, we were in the seats, um, and, but plainly visible to all that would see. I kept trying to drag him out, as, as you might have noticed. Um, but uh, if, I, if I had to guess you know, who this was, the stab wound is low in the body. Perhaps that's uh, the mark of a, of a halfling. Uh, um, or, and then I throw some other sort of suggestions out. Um, I think that we should track them down. Sort of. And indeed, up in the grid, there is a sheep who is sawing away at that sandbag rope. A little <laughs> tiny lamb. <laughs> Lost in the grid. <laughs> uh, what do you do with some information? Yep. All right, so I got a couple more questions from that DR, and then yeah, I'll go for it. Yeah. and then I'll try and respond. Who's really in control here? Like, is someone like watching the halfling do this, like with rapt attention? Or mm, I think you might see the silhouette of Lord Ashton turning and looking back just as he turns to leave for good. Okay. Uh. All right. Then I guess what should I be on the lookout for? Like, does this person have help or anything like that? Um, well, you probably need to be on the lookout for the other halfling. They're clearly a little bit more, uh, I will say that like, they may have been putting on a bit of a show as far as their incompetence goes. And they're sort of, you know, could be misdirect, right? So right, that one could be up to something bad too. Okay, and but to, but to answer your question, I think that like they're they're kind of like a little more competent than they've been putting on, right? So you yeah. know, okay, all right. Then uh, what I will do is I want to try and get a called shot on on it. Uh, what I want to ha what I want to happen if I'm successful is I want to try and stun them. So that they stop and cannot kill this Con person. Continue sawing at the rope. Yeah. Right. And then I want Maud's help to like tip them over the sides so they fall down. <laughs> okay, nice. Um, do a call trap. Okay. Nice. That is a big number. Like th 14. Nice. Um, <laughs> so I think, yeah, that's great. Um, I, I, I think what's going to happen here is, well, you just describe it. You give me the scene and then I'll pick it up. So describe what happens. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to elect not to do my damage because I don't want to kill this person. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I'll just very quickly like pull an arrow and like fire and it goes, you know, it, it 
like hits hits the little sheep's like pelt that's on the back of her head yeah. and like ricochets off and she just like drops her weapon and it goes falling down tumbling down yeah yeah and and like sticks in the ground next to this guy and then i'm like assassin and uh everyone looks up and then uh mod like comes in shoulders uh goes like a, like a charging tackle kind of into the side of the little sheep halfling and and they go tumbling over over the edge and like fall next to everyone nice nice um Fantastic. Um, no cliffhanger or anything. This feels like a good place to end the session. <sighs> With everything kind of like in play. Um, let's do the end of session move and then we'll call it a sesh. All right. Well, I think everybody is pretty proactively hitting flags. I, th I think I saw everybody hit one. Uh, you get to continue marking XP, Patrick, for your character because you get to carry all that over. Um, but so long as you hit a, f if you don't think you hit a flag, just say so. But I, I'm pretty sure everyone, it seems like everyone did. So mark an XP if you did. Let's look at alignment statements. All right. Use a gadget in a new and surprising way that it wasn't meant for. What do you think, Nico? I didn't get to use my gadget. as just, 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 just even in the way they were designed to. Maybe it's for. <laughs> Well, in the beginning you did, right? You did the little phasing thing in the wall to see the... Yeah, but it was designed to do it, so... Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, let's go to Opry. Upset a relationship to see what happens. I feel like you were doing that. <laughs> um, I think uh, there's some crossover there in the early scene where um, I'm calling Nico a coward and, uh, and then trying to play off Ashton, but I don't know if that quite hits... Um, yeah, I I don't know. Yeah, uh, I was thinking more of like, well, I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. We'll think about it a bit until you come back to it. Um, what's, yours is not written down, David. What is your, what's Shep's alignment thing? Uh, help an animal or spirit of the wild. So I fed Maud. Um, <laughs> I took on the caretaker role of the animals. Uh, I don't know. Those are loosely. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, <laughs> I denied uh, Maud killing the chicken when you suggested it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about all that. Let's keep going. Um, <laughs> Corwin, avoid detection or infiltrate a location. You, you kind of did the opposite of that. Uh, <laughs> so in every case, you were seen by someone. Um, so Did he sure. successfully poison the uh, the hand? Oh, that's true. Yeah, that was a. That's true. You did poison grit. Yeah, that's fair. Take an XP for that. Okay. Okay. And the group questions. Somebody just read them off. I don't have them in front of me. So somebody take them. Yeah. Um, did we learn something new and important about the world? Sure. Mark it, everybody. Mark an XP. Did we loot a memorable treasure? Yes. Um, got that fireball. The fireball one, one nothing else. else. But I th yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, and did we overcome a notable monster or enemy? We overcame a sheep halfling. <laughs> yeah, that I'm. Um, well, I mean, you guys did stop the assassination, so that's something. Um, yeah, I'll take it. Go ahead, and mark an XP. They're they're a big part of the scenario. So, uh, cool. All right. Well, that was the first proper session of Leisure Domain. Um, we will have more next week. We're making good progress. I think we'll definitely be able to finish by next time. So um, I feel pretty good about that. Uh, let's let's do Discord today. So I'm gonna um, I'll put a Discord link up in the in the hang in the Hangouts chat, the other chat, and then uh, I'll be there in like five minutes if anybody wants to join me. But you don't have to. If you got something else to do, that's fine too. All right.